The protocol tonight, I'm going to let Shannon Dow, who is my co-conspirator for the second year in a row, to, to make this project work, go over the protocol, how we'll, we'll start tonight, and then we'll get in, uh, immediately into it. Great. Thanks, Barry. Thank you all. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, so our protocol for the evening is we'll start with very brief introductions, and then we will go into uh, each of you giving three to five minutes of an opening statement around your thinking. Um, many people have had the chance to kind of read your initial thoughts about our, the models in our sector and um, where they are and where they need to be. Uh, so this is your chance to kind of provide that context, and then we will delve into a freewheeling discussion uh, that I'm sure it will be freewheeling. Uh, we will take a, a brief break after the meat of the discussion, and each of you will um, propose specific approaches that you think that the field needs to adopt as we move forward, and then we'll have a summation, and then we'll be done. So uh, in thinking about, um, oh, and uh, there's a hashtag for uh, this event, uh, hashtag dinnervention, if any of you are following at home or if any of you um, want to tweet while we're doing this or on a break, uh, hashtag dinnervention. Uh, one of the things I just want to put on the table with regard to models is something that I think a lot about is um, every provider of content is going through a revolution right now. Uh, newspapers, television, movie theaters, and the art sector. Uh, and the model I always look at is Netflix. And Netflix kind of was the bold player on the front and kind of revolutionized the television industry. And they've since readapted three times uh, to continue their relevance. And so I think um, I, I find that an interesting model to look at in terms of our sector. Uh, and is there a game changer out there uh, that has yet to be discovered to bring us into a new kind of era? And I really do think Netflix has shepherded a kind of renaissance in, in the television uh, content recently. So that's my little uh, model idea. But with that, we'll get started. Barry? Yeah, just one other thing, and, and that is that it, this is a dinner. So we're going to be having dinner during the course of this. We'll try to keep our claim to a minimum so that the people who are watching uh, can uh, follow along, but let's just start um, down here, John. We'll go around real quickly. Just introduce yourself from from your organization, and then we'll go back into a random order, and each guest will have a chance to throw some thoughts on the table. Great. I'm John Arroyo. I'm a doctoral candidate at MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning, and I've had 15 years of experience working with arts agencies and our staff. Hi, I'm Laura Bonds. I live here in Denver, Colorado, where I am the director of community and Hi, I'm Ebony McKinney. I'm a co-founder of Emerging Arts Professionals. I sit on the advisory board of Grants for the Arts, and I'm an independent consultant in San Francisco. I'm Sanjeet Sethi. I'm the executive director of the Santa Fe Art Institute. My name is Ron Reagan. I'm a vocalist and performing artist, and right now I'm employed by the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation as a program officer. I'm Rachel Grossman from Washington, D.C., and I am the ringleader for organizational advancement at Dog and Pony, D.C. I'm Karina Mengi Ward, and I'm the director of Activating Innovation at EMC Arts. I'm Sixto Wagen, uh, the director for the Center for Arts Leadership at the University of Houston. Fabulous. Um, Rachel, would you like to lead us off? Sure. Uh, well, I want to say that it's, it's very much a privilege to be here, and I'm a really honored and a touch terrified, um, but mostly honored and privileged. Um, and I do want to say that privilege is something that I want to uh, use as sort of a framing device for my ideas. Um, uh, I think a lot about privilege these days, um, and I think that it's integral to recognize that with privilege um, comes with it uh, sort of the tension of privilege and uh, responsibility. Um, so the first thing I need to do is I feel like I have a responsibility to thank, in addition to our hosts, a number of people who have made it possible for me to be here today, which is Denise Gant, uh, Ellie Mitchell, Rebecca Rice, Don McAndrews, Michael Rode, Eric Booth, Jeff Herman, Howard Shawitz, Wickham Avery, and Lorraine Ressiger Sloan, all of whom made my life possible. Um, second, uh, so I worked uh, full time for four nonprofit theaters um, between the years of 1998 and 2011. Um, and my first full time salary, which was not an entry level position, was for $24,000. Um, and when I left, it was for $52,000. Um, I held two senior management positions 
Um, and uh, the differential between me and colleagues of the same age um, and the same years of professional experiences was a minimum of $20,000. Um, I was at the lower end of that, um, and uh, I was working in either education or audience engagement. Uh, and this is not unique to me or the organizations that I was working at. Um, so I'm curious as to which positions are more privileged in arts educations and are in arts organizations and why. Do we collectively agree that that's appropriate? Is salary the ultimate indicator of privilege? Who makes salary decisions? And why are or aren't those processes transparent? The second thing is uh, I have read cover to cover every Wallace Foundation study that has ever come out about audience engagement since 2001 with the RAND study. Um, and so I kind of lost my shit when a new framework for building participation in the arts came out earlier this week. And I got, or I'm sorry, when including that study. And so I lost my shit when the road uh, to results was released earlier this week. Got very excited about it. Um, and got very excited about the corresponding grants program. And then, oh no, though that grants program is only going to be available to a pre-selected, already determined uh, group of organizations who are in the multi-million dollar category. And everyone that is in the study, uh, all the organizations that are in the study were all um, approximately two million and above, some of them in the multi-million. The nine effective strategies that were outlined in that, in the study, um, really didn't take into account any of the community building techniques that smaller arts organizations, of which there are many more across the country, um, are utilizing and engaging in. So what responsibility do national funders have to the biodiversity of the national arts ecosystem? Why are majestic redwoods privileged over hardy shrubs? And what is the relationship of the redwoods to the shrubs? Um, the last thing I want to bring up is uh, Dog and Pony is in this really interesting um, position right now where um, we are premiering a new work um, called Toast um, and it's, we're using this as our first steps in our company's uh, uh, re recommitment to a diversity and inclusion initiative and the expanding of our network of local artists. Um, so we hired two to three performers for every role in a cast of five, which we are a cast of five characters. So we uh, have now 15 basically actors playing five roles. Um, and as it turns out, we unintentionally met and had to cast an actor who happens to be deaf. So we when we hired him, we were required not only to have a significant learning curve and a significant cultural shift, but now we have an additional unplanned financial investment that we have to make in order to be working. Um, now we have a cast of 17 actors. We have learned a lifetime of lessons that have come from this, uh, from this uh, journey that we have been on with all of these actors. But now we're in this place where we're potentially facing a budget deficit for the end of the year. So should we not have hired him? Should we not have hired the rest of the ensemble? Does working with new artists place an undue burden on our organizational stability? What responsibility do we have as a company to be actually forwarding our mission? What responsibility do we have as a company to be holding our company stable? And these are all the questions that I have going on in my head as we continue to move forward, as we think about this cycle of perpetuating ourselves as arts organizations and perpetuating ourselves as um, service servers to our community. I'm next. Hi. <laughs> Out there. Please, um, thank you. And thanks, Rachel, for kicking us off. I know this is not an easy thing to do. Thank you. Um, so I think it's really important to start with story. And I'm glad that you did share a little bit about your background and how you came to your work. Um, so I mostly grew up in Perry, Georgia, which is a pretty rural town in the center of the state. It's far from Atlanta. It's not Metro Atlanta at all. I grew up in a very strong African-American community, uh, six generations on land that my family has owned in that area. Um, I went to the church that my great-grandmother went to, 
and sang in those walls the songs that she sang. Um, I sat at my grandfather's knee, perhaps. I uh, can't remember if it was his knee, but for his sermon lecture discussions every day after school. I was stained by the red dirt that my family has been stained by for generations. I drank that water and I breathed that air and I learned how to make my godmother's red velvet cake and I listened to Luther Vandross a lot <laughs> and had Friday fish with my grandparents who I think might be tuned in which would be really exciting um, <laughs> right now. So that is to say that I'm very much a person of place um, and I think that context and having a really strong cultural foundation from which to experience this very broad and vast world to which we're increasingly connected is really, really important. And I also come from a place where what has been so transformative to me from an arts or a cultural perspective was part of everyday life. It wasn't something exceptional that I bought a ticket to experience, it was just there. And I made a list before I got here of all the transformational arts experiences that I had and I tried to make that pretty broad, but a very small minority of those happened in nonprofit spaces. Those were family spaces and those were community spaces that I grew up in, or they were for-profit concert halls. <laughs> I got to see the roots and that was mind-blowing and transformational, <laughs> right? And so um, I guess all this is to say that I bring these experiences very, they're very important to me in terms of how I work as a performing artist in my practice, as well as how I work as a uh, person who has employed at a foundation, which I have been for the last seven years. So I just want to make a few offerings into this space, this little nether region in between the tables. Um, and uh, one is that I think context is sovereign, and I'm taking that from Roberto Bedoya, who may be taking it from somewhere else, but um, from the Tucson Pima Arts Council, who's a friend and mentor of mine. Um, and I really think that as in as a field, to the extent that we can call this a field, because I think we're so diverse and we have so many different practices and we're doing so many different things that I don't know what the arts and culture field really is. Um, that being said, uh, I really want to talk about place and that we should be examining our social and political and economic context all the time. Like that should be part of our work to be engaged with that. Um, I don't want to necessarily use the word citizenship, but as a community, wherever we are of place, of practice, that I think we really need to engage questions of the structures of power that govern the way that we're able to function and work. And I hope that we can really get into some of that discussion this evening. Um, I think we should be talking about racism. I think we should be talking about sexism. I think we should be talking about capitalism. And I think we have to engage those things honestly if we're going to actually figure out how our field can shift and work well and better. Um, secondly, I think that culture can be a tool for building and producing view of things. I think it can also be a weapon. And I think we need to be honest about that as well. And thinking just, for example, specifically about colonization, if you will, um, one of the first things you do if you want to destroy people is you, you physically assault them, right? But a second and very important thing to do is to assimilate shift the cultural norms and values, say what they think is beautiful is no longer beautiful, right? And I think that our field, intentionally or otherwise, still perpetuates those same sort of ideas about drawing boundaries and saying, like, this is what's in and this is what's not. And I think we need to really interrogate that. And uh, lastly, I just want to say that I think cultural equity is a, an, an important social justice issue because having the resources, however you might construe that, to create the things that are beautiful and meaningful to you and to your people, whoever those people are, is a really important um, foundation for thinking about what's possible politically and beyond. So I take that from Jeff Chang, another friend of mine, and I'll stop there. Thanks. Um, so I'm really, really thankful to be here and I'm thankful for the conversations we've actually had already um, online and in the cocktail hour that we enjoyed before this. Um, and I'm thankful to <laughs> Barry and Shannon for putting this together and to my colleagues at EMC for supporting me and for my colleague Kendra especially who is tweeting away at Arts Forward through all of this. Um, I will admit to some skepticism about the topic uh, of models. I thought, um, how can I make a meaningful contribution to a conversation about models when I don't think models are what we need for the future? Um, to me, a model is 
it's a standard way of doing things. It's reliable, it's replicable. We know it'll bring us success because it has before, at least somewhere else. And I don't believe that what we need now is a new standard way of doing things. I think that many of our old models have outlived themselves and that the last thing we should do is replace them with new ones. Um, because the challenges that we face today are deeply, deeply complex. Challenges like figuring out how artists and organizations can play a crucial role in our communities and how to cultivate the next generation of artists and arts leaders and how to wrestle, wrestle with issues of equity. Um, and I believe that truly complex challenges require a different way of working and a fundamentally different way of thinking, a different mindset. Something that we talk about all the time at my organization at EMC Arts is the difference between um, a complicated challenge and a complex challenge. And that's, that's sort of one offering I want to make to the group. A complicated challenge is like building a rocket ship. So it requires lots of expertise, lots of research, a fantastic blueprint. It's labored and it's difficult, but ultimately it's knowable. And once you've built the rocket ship and you have the blueprint, you can probably do it again. But a complex challenge is like parenting. So it's hmm. the strategy that you use today might not, probably won't work tomorrow, and how you raise one child won't get the same results with a second. The conditions are always shifting, and it's only through trial and error that you can discover what works and what doesn't. And ultimately, it's, it's the terrain of the unknowable. And I believe that the most pressing and important challenges facing artists arts organizations in the art sector as a whole today are not like rocket ships, but are mm. like parenting. Mm. And for me, that means we need not a new set of models, but a new mindset. We have to stop treating complex problems like they're complicated. We have to stop calling in the rocket scientists and the models and the best practices when what we need is to experiment our own way forward, even if that means failing mm. often. We have to get comfortable with conflict and ambiguity and vulnerability and not knowing. And we have to rigorously reflect on all that we do and be open to what we learn. We have to engage with people who have different views and experiences because it's, it's really at the boundaries or the collisions of the boundaries that new ideas emerge. We have to recognize that we're working in a complex, interconnected, non-rational system in which we are each and our organizations are only one of many players. And I think this is particularly difficult work. I think humans have a tendency to want to see the world as complicated as the rocket ship. I think that's a lot easier actually than wrestling with complexity. But I think it's in the same way that I think it's easier to talk about broken models than it is to talk about a broken mindset. And Despite all of that, um, I'm going to be making an attempt during this dinner to pull the conversation away from being about what we do to being about how we think, because I, I think that's where real and lasting change is actually um, born out of and where a new and unimagined possibilities um, for artists and arts organizations and the cultural field can actually um, emerge. So it probably makes sense that I follow for you because I think what I'm thinking echoes a lot of what you're thinking. Mm. And in 2008, I was working in Los Angeles where I'm from, and I was working at a local art service agency doing cultural planning work. And I was matriculating and moving to Boston to do a master's degree in urban planning. And I thought I was always sort of at a bridge between art, cultural planning, cities, all of these things. And I had so many friends say to me, wow, you're really making a career move. Like, this is like different. And I was like, is it? Like, I actually thought I was kind of making this connection. But I thought about who those people were and it made me nervous because I thought, wow, if you guys are working at arts agencies and you see what I'm doing very different and then what you're doing, then maybe we really have a much bigger problem than I realize. And I'm part of the sort of why do, we new, why do we need new models anyway sort of camp? I think a lot about the way we think about problem solving and problem setting. And we focus a lot on problem solving, but we don't necessarily talk about whether or not we frame the right problem and if all the resources we're putting into this money, time, energy is going the right way. I think first I'd like to challenge sort of our idea of what it means to be creative and not necessarily what it means to be an artist. 
Um, I think there are a lot of people who are creative people and never maybe in the history of the world have there been more creative people than people who make apps, people who make things at home, uh, culinary arts, right? Who wouldn't traditionally consider themselves an artist. But maybe they don't get involved or they're included in sort of the audiences we think we're trying to reach, right? Um, and I think it's really hard to categorize creativity. So this sort of creates a friction and some competition. I don't think it necessarily has to be this way, but I do think there's a whole group that we're not capturing. Um, and these are sort of the like little M or little A. These are people who don't have MFA, but they teach a Zoom class, right? And they're like, oh, I'm into this, right, at their local neighborhood. But they say I'm not an artist. And I'm like, but I think you're actually doing a great service and you're you know, exhibiting you know, your creativity. Second, we've talked a little bit about context, and within this, this idea of models, are we looking at models within the art sector or not? And if we're looking at within the art sector, what is the scale we're looking at? What is our unit of analysis? Um, I wonder sometimes if we set ourselves up for failure if we're trying to adopt models from other resources and other sectors that are maybe over-resourced. And in my mind, and Karina, you talked a little bit about this failure, I've never seen a group or a sector, business, right, thrive on failure, like this is a lesson, they call it disruption, they have terms, they have classes. Mm -hmm. This is sort of celebrated. You, you messed up somewhere, you'll pick up again, the next project will be better, right? And somewhere, maybe because we're tied to this 501c3 model, or whatever it is, we can't tell the funder that the grant we're applying for might not work out. You know, it gets to this idea, is the process more important than the final project? And that's, that's necessarily a question. I also think we get stuck really in sort of regional and local scales, and I wonder what it would be like if we moved beyond this. And I think a lot about these scales in terms of like large disciplines. So we think of like, a, oh, a small community theater looks at a large opera in a major urban center, and this community theater is in a small rural area in the south, right? And they say, I'm going to try to replicate what they did because it seemed to work in Chicago. But maybe that doesn't work because there are all sorts of different contexts, right? Political, economic, social demographics, all these other things. What if we were able to set up a network of people that wasn't just about the regions, but about these sort of larger topics? And we're looking at things that are big civic issues, right? Climate change, AIDS, homelessness, affordable housing. Um, something like this, I think, would also force us to work with partners that might not be necessarily who we thought we would work for. Um, and it would develop a new sense of cooperation. Um, I'm really interested in sort of what social service agencies are doing and groups that don't traditionally use arts in their sort of uh, vision or mission statements, but they're doing really interesting artwork and they're reaching other groups and so then the art stays behind and says, hey, the hospital obviously that's gonna get funded in the school and the affordable housing, but the community center's not gonna get funded for the art gallery. Why did that happen, right? Um, so I'm really thinking, how do you look at art that's not a panacea but it's sort of a vehicle for connecting other things, and it's sort of the work that I've been trying to do, uh, making this bridge, and maybe not trying to be as afraid of failure as I think we are. So I think the question I have is, do models help us, or do they allow us to become more complacent? And if they help us, are we looking beyond just the art sector or not? Well, I'm also extremely privileged to be here and honored, and my brain is spinning already, and uh, I'm already throwing what I thought I was going to say out the window, because there have already been so many compelling things said. Karina, I've been reading your blog and your newsletter for a long time now, and to hear you articulate some of these ideas is really exciting. Um, I loved what you said about experimenting our way forward, and uh, just that delineation between complex and complicated is um, really simple and really helpful. Um, so. I represent, without question, the probably the oldest, the biggest, the most conventional and traditional you know, organization of any represented here at the table, Colorado Symphony, 75 years old. We have an annual budget of $12 million. We employ 120 people, 80 of whom are musicians full-time who are um, in a labor agreement, they're you know, in a union. Um, another 20 who are stagehands, also in a union, and then 20 or so staffers, uh, marketing, development, all the usual things. Um, we are, on a daily basis, faced with a very complex set of challenges. It's not building a rocket ship. We're trying to figure out how to navigate um, some very 
conflicting um, mandates. One, which is to preserve the culture and the tradition of this music and this art form that we serve, that's part of our mission, um, but also to respond to a mandate that we change. Um, I come to this discussion with a you know, fundamental belief that this art form, symphonic music and, and other high arts, if you will, um, are worth preserving and that they do contribute something to the community and, and society at large. And granted, I come from a background of, you know, I was a punk rocker in high school. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a classical music aficionado. I'm learning every day. Um, my background is in, you know, writing and alternative journalism. Um, I used to run a nonprofit in Ethiopia that connects kids to literacy training through, um, through books. Um, and then I ran a, a social justice program in Denver that uses hip hop and, and spoken word poetry to get artists involved in solving social problems. So the symphony is a weird world for me. Um, and I've been there about two years. So I will share with you, and um, you know, I said to someone earlier, I'm not afraid to speak freely about what goes on in my organization because frankly, the people who might have an issue with it are not watching. Um, they're not engaging with these kinds of conversations. <laughs> So yeah, we, we face all the, all the things, all the scary things that people think go on, they do. We are beholden to some traditional models. We are funded by major donors. Our audience is mainly white. So is our orchestra. Um, so are our donors and our, and our funders. All of those things are true. Um, you know, we are competing with a constantly ringing death knell that says that our very art form is dead. Um, I don't believe that's true. I don't think there's a lot to in encourage us that, that that's not true. And I see that in particular with the kids that I work with in schools who, you know, they love to play the flute and they would love to compose music, which we're giving them opportunities to do, so thereby removing some of the barriers that allow them access to participating in the musical arts. Um, you know, Denver, speaking of place, is an interesting place to be right now. A lot of the things that have been mentioned we're already doing here. This is a highly collaborative city. We have some really strong public-private partnerships. We have strong support in the mayor's office. Um, so that's a value that we have. I think we're not as entrenched in some of the sort of social and cultural hierarchies that were alluded to in some of the papers. You know, it's the spirit of the West. It's kind of a cliche, but it's also true. And I think you see that what's going on with our symphony. We, uh, we collaborate with other art forms. We work with other nonprofits, large and small. We commissioned local artists to create original works of art. We did the Beck Song Reader. We were the only orchestra in the mm -hmm. world so far to do that, um, the prosumer, prosumer experience. Um, so we're, we're pretty cool, actually. Um, and I think I can safely say that we're the only organization, the only orchestra in the world that was featured on both TMZ and the New York Times on the same day um, <laughs> because of some news about uh, partnership that we did with the emerging cannabis industry, which is here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. So some people think we're brilliant, some people think we're crazy, um, but we are trying new things. And I am faced every day with the question of how do we, um, how do we take what are some entrenched realities, older, established leadership, younger, emerging leaders, for who, there is a delta between these two. Um, how do we get everybody around the same table to even start to appreciate different languages and, and approaches to um, leadership and transformation and service. So anyway, it's mm. a taste. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, I reiterate, thank you very much for coming. I've mean, just been inspired by everybody and what's up in your and I'm just trying to figure out if I'm going to go with what I wrote or <laughs> I'm going to go off the cuff a bit. Um, I guess Part of this is that, uh, before I go read anything, some of these ideas are broad strokes, and it's very difficult for me who embraces complexity to actually just kind of swallow some of this. And so much of what I'm saying, I recognize that there are conflicts, that there are exceptions, and there are things that we really want to have. But I also think that um, as we talk about innovation, as we talk about what, model, or what organizations and interesting people are doing, that's not necessarily the norm. And that this is the point where the people around this table have, ready, have been very much enmeshed and integral in those innovative practices or know part of it and are, I think, uh, actually better informed than most of us because those of us who work in the art, like, we're so entrenched in the day-to-day -day 
that we don't get to look up. Mm -hmm. And it is now the fact that I am at a university starting a new program that I have the opportunity to think about my entire career at Diverse Works, think about the artists and the communities that I served, think about where I existed in that aspect and as an artist, as a, uh, as an activist, but no, no longer, and, like, and, and where does that activism now re exist? Um, and so this has also been my question, and how do we translate to middle America? How do we translate to the flyover zone? How are we really looking at if, we, if this innovation actually happens in, in the middle, then actually, I think then we've really addressed some of these larger problems. But the larger problems, I think, are about those hierarchies, are about power, are about this uh, perceived idea that bigger is better, that New York is actually the mecca that we all have to be measured against, and that, um, and so, I guess specifically, I want to call into question: How are we being evaluated? What are what, what are those ideas and what are those metrics and what is that methodology that's actually reinforcing this idea about institutionalization? That's actually reinforcing this idea that I am here in order to, or we as an organization are here to perpetuate ourselves as an organization, instead of once again, why did we start? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that when we talk about strategic planning, part of those questions were, I think people skip that first part of why do we exist? And then they skip the second part of how has things changed around us? We only think of, people were thinking about it in competition. People were thinking about, okay, I can actually just kind of take some of these ideas from last strategic plan because, well, I don't have time, I don't have money in order to deal with that new consultant and that new resource. So how can we actually start shifting some of those ideas? Um, and we also have now created this whole, whole aspect where we are churning out uh, programs. And some of these programs are, are sticking and are really interesting, but there is no infrastructure to actually make them part of the core mission. And how does that aspect of transparency and innovation actually come back to uh, where the centers of power are in terms of board, funders, and uh, heads of organizations. And um, so I think that I often think about this democratization of art, like how many, how many people actually get tools to make art, and that art is being made, and YouTube, and all of this. And there's also a separation between those who are making art and these institutions of the museum districts or all of that. And I'm hoping that we are not inexorably moving toward a shopping mall system of art distribution. And that there are going to be anchor tenants, and then there are going to be <laughs> boutiques that actually address specific quaint communities. Um, can we actually move to a transaction, can we shift from a transactional experience in order to move to a participatory model? And, and do we have access to process, again, and not just the product? Um, can we recommit to that transparency? And I think that that's where I see a lot of successful organizations to do that. Um, again, I would also like systems that embrace failure. We look at art, and arts, the artists embrace failure. They learn, why can organizations not do this? And why do we hide when we fail? Because that's what the funders or our board and all that. And we put all that underneath whatever. We are, we're hiding our vegetables, but I think the question is, how do we actually make this a culture that we can learn from that? Um, and I would also love to be in a culture where we're not targeting uh, audiences of color or whatever demographic, and that we're actually uh, inviting respondents into our process, and that we are thinking about what that actually will mean when you have different people mm -hmm. at the table. And are we really understanding that there are going to be multiple shifts and that we have to resource them, change them, and you know, give up some of those powers? Cool. Well, thank you. I want to thank uh, West Staff for having me here. And I'm so excited to be with you group of smart people. Um, I want to kind of take a little cue from Ron and talk just a little bit about my, just a second about my background and how I do think, I'm 
living in San Francisco now, but I've come from Pittsburgh, a pretty working class town. And I think um, I do have this lens of class that I always apply to things. And you know, since I've been in San Francisco, cultural equity has uh, been a community or an issue that I've worked around a lot. And I feel that I speak predominantly or I work with and I guess feel a, a part of and try to um, try to speak adequately for small and mid-sized organizations and those ro deeply rooted in underserved communities, those pursuing experimental work. Um, so I just want to preface by, by saying that. And I also kind of, I do big picture thinking, but I'm also a real nuts and bolts person. So my uh, talk might be a little bit different than some other people's. Um, so many talk about risk being fundamental to arts organizations, but you know, what groups are best positioned to speak up, scale up, and take artistic, organizational, and financial risk? What options exist for small and mid-sized arts organizations when access to government and foundation funding is limited? So the model that I chose to look at was the funding model that I think um, focuses, over-focuses perhaps, on um, government and foundation support. So I'd like to explore ideas around enterprise, social wealth, mutuality, and cultivating generosity within networks and even across networks. Um, in 2004, Courtney Fink, executive director of Southern Exposure, an art-centered visual arts organization in San Francisco, found she had little access to local foundation support because of her budget size, under a million dollars, and because of her discipline focus, uh, visual arts. Um, additionally, the gallery that SOEX, that's the short name, um, was located in for 32 years, required a mandatory seismic upgrade, so relocation was imminent. Courtney decided then and there to begin a 10-year effort to cultivate a strong individual donor base, catalyzed by this capital campaign. By 2009, SOEX moved into their new space, and now in 2014, 60% of their income comes from individual donors. An auction and a quirky event that kind of fits SOEX's style, called the Monster Drawing Rally, raises 20% of funds, and another 40 comes from membership and individual donors who are deeply invested in Southern Exposure's success. Through all this, Courtney is grateful that she's never felt pressure to compromise work or drift from the mission. She's followed her intuition, experimented, adapted, um, about the, and there's some kind of, um, there's certainty that the time and energy she devotes is worth it, but it's a lot of work. She's had to divert a lot of energy to individual donors, but for now it seems her system is working. So I wanna talk a bit about the work I'm doing. I just began advising a small for-profit gallery in Oakland. The owner curator wants to emphasize the transformational potential of arts, community, and economic development, and create a stable revenue source for from membership and events. So I've thought about many ways that we can, in Karina's words, harness the abundance around us and how to help this gallery owner build generous networks um, around the space and the artists, around the community. Um, we talked about the thing, their unusual model of art by subscription, um, how that could be a way to keep members engaged, the laundromats pro public art, or I'm sorry, the laundromat projects, public art potluck, regular microfinancing events modeled on Detroit soup, or the old school model of the giving circle um, could also build community and weave networks while generating support. Um, and I also um, end by talking about this idea of the public narrative, which I've also put some thought into. And it's developed by Marshall Gans, who's an organizer and Harvard professor. It's a public, it's a tool for engaging um, commitment of potential advocates. 
um, an activist. It starts with the story of self, how I got here, how I got to this organization. The story of us, why are we all here? Why do we do this? And the story of now, why is it important right now at this time? This is a structure that many people internally and externally can insert themselves into. As Rachel suggested in a recent blog post that she did for AFTA, audiences can be partners sharing messages and acting as ambassadors and allies. So what's the potential, I wonder, for firing up networks with stories of mission and meeting, keeping the conversation going with those in your corner, but also connecting with new supporters and partners online and offline through viral video, frictionless sharing, earworms, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, hackathons, urban prototyping, co-working spaces, art house, Pecha Kucha sessions, salons, pop-up storefronts. Where is the potential here to build community among ourselves and to connect to new networks, new sources of, of social wealth? Um, well, I want to um, say thank you to the West Staff Foundation for inviting me into uh, having me be part of this real brain trust of people. Um, and it's been it's, uh, 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 impressive uh, and moving to hear different people's perspectives. Uh, the backgrounds uh, from which they're approaching these things. Uh, and um, and it already my mind is probably going 90 different directions. Um, and, but I guess I think fundamentally for me, um, I should start off by saying that I represent an organization uh, uh, that replaced a mission statement with a mission question some months ago. Uh, and inherently, in part, uh, it's really reflective on a lot of the dialogues that we see here. Uh, and so our, our mission question at, the, at SFAI is um, how can an organization engage with diverse forms of creativity, um, work collaboratively with local, national, and international organizations, and address some of the most pressing issues of our times. Uh, the reason the shift for, towards a question was inherent because uh, we wanted to make sure we as an organization don't rest on the complacency of a statement. Um, and I'm not trying to solely be semantic here. Um, it is to say that we need to keep moving. Uh, we need to constantly be aware of the fact that the ground underneath us is constantly shifting. Um, so uh, I'm appreciative of everything that's gone on here. I, I'll actually um, start off my remarks by a, a quote from a, 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 well, either you could call him a political henchman or a, or a <laughs> provocateur, Fishhooks McCarthy. And he said, I think, I think the quote is, uh, Lord, give us health and strength, and we'll steal the rest. <laughs> and um, and I, I guess I've been thinking a lot about stealing, like in the sense, mm -hmm. just in terms of, I'm not sure um, those of us that are in the kind of cultural and creative business of trying to provide this as a, as a service, as trying to provide this as kind of an experience, as to provide this uh, as a reflective component to go ahead and help drive change, are doing enough stealing. Uh, I'm not sure we're, I'm not sure we're, I don't know if we call it strategic kleptomania or something like that, but I'm, I'm not sure we're thieving enough from whether it's from different disciplines, from the past, uh, from future projects. Uh, I'm less interested in the silos of saying, ooh, now he's doing something with science, but rather just being able to realize that it's a much more hard-scrabbled world. I think it is, a, it is kind of a bare-knuckled world out there. Um, ideas that come to mind that I like to think about thieving from that cause me to reflect as the ED of an organization that I have a tremendous degree of faith in uh, are things like the shrine at Ise in Japan, which is, a, if you see this shrine, it's got one site which lays fallow for, I think, 18 years, and then it's torn down and it's rebuilt on the other site. This idea of questioning issues around longevity. Um, I'm using these ideas to steal them, in the sense I'm, um, I don't believe in the original idea. I believe everything is an iteration of everything else. And I wonder if we somehow put ourselves in a false sense of privilege by somehow inherently trying to ensure the original idea. Uh, and so um, another thing I've been thinking about too, and I'm stealing this from nautical engineers, is this idea um, of the writing arm. And the writing arm is this pitch point that's uh, the horizontal distance between the center of gravity and the center of buoyancy of a ship that's displaced from the upright position. In English, that means that's the point to which a ship can rewrite itself but if you go past that, it won't be able to rewrite itself. The thing that intrigues me, and I should preface this by saying I, I'm not 
maritime at all. I have nothing <laughs> like, like I can swim just barely and that's about it. And, this, and so, um, so I'm sure I'm screwing something up here, but I like this idea that it's not hierarchical. I like the fact that these factors are working together. It's the, it's buoyancy, it's gravity. Uh, it's these other ideas of the same footings. And I feel like I transform that into some of these questions that we have. Um, what happens when nautical engineer? What, what happens when we do what nautical engineers do all the time, which is to find the writing moment, that point which is the absolute maximum to which a ship can rewrite itself from? Um, where's our center of gravity, uh, and uh, what's our meta center? Um, uh, is that the combination of acumen and lived experience? And I guess for me, this idea that we live in kind of a shifting, buoyant, turbid kind of world uh, is significantly important for me. All right. A lot of stuff on the table. <laughs> uh, I would suggest that uh, you can now have your conversation. You can riff off of what other people said. Uh, you can expand on anything that wasn't said. But um, you have a back and forth exchange. Uh, who would like to weigh in? And then it's sort of wide open. Also reinforce the hierarchies of who actually gets uh, how work is seen, who sees that work, and how they continue to do that. And I think that one of the things that when we were talking about the Petru and all of these these different models, how can we get some of that out so that it's not just about uh, the local people, but other people get to see that? And how are we making these connections of local, national? How are we continuing mm -hmm. to make that trans that permeability? function that's good, that works better for in, in a number of people. So just wanted to throw that out. Yeah, that with John's idea about having these issue areas and figuring out how we can all, artists or creative people and people in other sectors can work, work around those issues and what's the potential of that and what might that look like. I mean, and I guess I've seen those things happening somewhat with Urban prototyping, there's a lot of urban prototyping in San Francisco, so I hesitate to talk about it. It's almost like talking about innovation or design thinking. But, um, <laughs> but it is an interesting way to bring people together and get them active and creating. There's this intersection of um, creativity and kind of maker culture that I think is really interesting and kind of encompasses this idea of creative city and what does it take what what kind of problem solving this issue of complexity mm -hmm. complex cities creative cities mm -hmm. you know how are we interacting where does the arts fit mm -hmm. are we still relevant mm -hmm. i think this goes a little bit also to the power concept that ron was talking about like I guess, to a certain extent, all of us working in the arts have given ourselves a certain legitimacy and authority because of our experience, our knowledge, our own skill sets and creative backgrounds, right? So we've decided, even decided here, who gets to sit at this table. But how different would this conversation be if we had a lot of people who weren't arts advocates, right? Who were maybe the naysayers who'd be like, I have something to say, but you never invite me, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's interesting, and I, and I feel like we, we talk a lot to ourselves but um, it's, um, it's, it's definitely something that's been on my mind. Because mm -hmm. what if we embrace actually as a, if, if we said there was a field, which I'm not really excited about that, but I'm just, let's ignore this part of my statement, okay? <laughs> so let's ignore the field part. So if we said there was a field and we actually addressed the field or artists at large, like really, why, let's say the arts aren't valuable. I can't believe I'm now saying this right now. Devil's advocate. But let's, right. but let's say they're not, like why do we just assume that the arts are valuable? 
why is that an assumption that we're all always constantly coming to and just saying like, we're valuable, you should like us. We're valuable, you should come to our museum, you should come to see my show, you should give me money because I'm an artist and because the arts are valuable. Hmm. I don't think that's wrong to propose because I think half the world in America works off that assumption. Yeah. So we spend half of our work trying to change their minds, right? Which I, which I don't mean to turn the center into a case of like why we should talk about why the arts are valuable, but yeah. I mean, it goes back to sort of this idea of like why, you know, we were talking earlier of sort of like why aren't we curing cancer? Why aren't we actually out doing other things? Like why have we chosen to do this work? which we know in this, in, this, in this field, in this sector, in the work that we're doing, we know that there are, we may not make as much money or the quality of life may be different. And it, aside from the fact of how much control we may actually have over those factors, of which I think, I keep touching you because we were talking about yes, this earlier. And because I must touch you. Um, why? <laughs> I mean, I could talk about some transformative experiences for me. And Ron, you had a whole list, mm -hmm. you said, of things that transformed you. I mean, I think I can just think of my, in my little mission neighborhood, you know, first moving there from San Francisco. Um, one of the reasons that I moved was, you know, my mother passed away and I just needed to change my life, change my outlook. And being in the mission for Day of the Dead, and participating in the festival mm -hmm. and walking with the um, walking with the people, hearing the drums. I mean, I always feel not always, but I often feel renewed by the tiny arts experiences that I have in in San Francisco, and it's one of the reasons that I lived there and I love living mm -hmm. there. I mean, I life can I mean be difficult be very difficult and I find all the little arts experiences I've had and also the way it brings people together socially I think is important um, for lots of reasons and there's lots of arguments I'm hearing now about arts education as well and what it means to not have that what if we have kids who only have you know tech is such a big thing now if it's only tech there's no no music, no drawing, no painting. What would that mean for our universe? I mean, might we as well just have robots? I, I mean, I wonder if, I mean, in part, this is, this is about challenging some of those hierarchical systems that we were yeah. talking about earlier. Yeah. Because I, and I think that that occurs internally. Because on one hand, um, um, the Day of the Dead parade is a really great example. Um, but it's uh, the the desire for us to formalize it or somehow institutionalize mm. it or somehow um, and we're, we're re you really see there is a degree of community scholarship in the sense you see this knowledge basis that exists mm -hmm. within a community and it's rich and it's emergent and it's asymmetric and it's dirty and dusty and heartfelt uh, and and to resist the urge to somehow put some kind of formalized whether it's an mm -hmm. academic or institutional stamp or mark in it, around it, or on top of it. And I, I guess I, that's kind of one thing that I think of when I, when I hear some of this. And I, having moved just to, to New Mexico, uh, if you go there on Good Friday, the procession to uh, the, uh, the chapel at Shamayo that occurs from all over. You see people walking all over. And it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a rich and invested procession, which you rarely see, uh, except in certain communities. Um, mm -hmm. And you just have to watch, or you have to participate. I also wonder, organizationally and institutionally, if in the same way, uh, I feel like academically, one had to revisit language and we had to start becoming more inclusive in our language and ditch the male pronoun. And we had to go ahead and make sure the fact that we were inclusive. I, I think that cultural organizations oftentimes have to really start to think if does the arts, the term, the arts, does it start to go ahead and categorize and really box us in? And that's one of the reasons why mm -hmm. there was a very fundamental conversation um, when we changed our mission to say it's creative practice, um, mm -hmm. which ideally opens it up to the architects and to the urban planners and to the poets and to, the, to make sure that that field is significantly more inclusive. I think, well, I was thinking about this earlier when someone was talking about the tension between um, Sort of practice or process and product. And I think sometimes when we talk about art, it becomes easy to talk about the product or the output or the object. And what I would be really interested to see is if we could think more as a field 
of practice, um, of thinking about what it means to put to use the artistic process. Mm -hmm. yes. And the artistic process, which is full of tolerance for failure and ambiguity and iteration and learning, what would it mean to put that at the center of our organizational structure and culture? What if our organizations actually mirrored the creative practice and maybe we moved to thinking about creative practice instead of artistic process? But also, what would it mean to put that artistic process or practice at the center of community change efforts mm -hmm. and the capacity for art to open up people's hearts and minds and open up new fields of possibility to wrestle with paradox and tension to, to um, balance discipline and openness. Mm -hmm. I actually think that that is such a huge asset that we have as a field that we could better articulate, better share, um, and, and put to use both mm -hmm. in our own field and our own organizations um, and in the wider mm -hmm. and in the wider world, mm -hmm. I guess. And we could potentially cure cancer by doing that. I mean, <laughs> Who so knows? To your point, I mean, I think, and I feel like I see a shift of that consciousness raising that people are making that connection between artistic and creative processes and how they relate to other disciplines or just ways of being, leadership models. Um, you know, something that I've heard repeated in, various ways throughout this dinner so far is, is this notion of, you know, the donor, the funder guiding what we do and what we don't do, and that so often, you know, the impediment to experimentation is what's that donor's reaction going to be. Um, I was encouraged this, earlier this week, I attended a presentation by Art Place America, and they, you know, they talked about in their granting process now, they encourage people to just be very honest about what it is that they believe they can possibly accomplish in the course of their project that, that they're asking for and to check in periodically. And if it's not going well, to not hide the vegetables, but to put them right out there and say, this is what's happening, we're going through a process. Um, we have something to contribute to the conversation and to your future grant making based on what we're experiencing. So they're contributing to sort of this evolving collective awareness about what works and what doesn't. So. To me, that was an encouraging um, signal of maybe some changes that are happening at the at the funder level, and certainly Art Place and the whole placemaking movement is very much about how do you transfer the intrinsic value of the arts to solving and addressing social problems and responding to community need and desire. So, you know, hopefully, everybody continue will continue to learn about this and. Uh, you know, through these types of networking activities and others like them, so just continue to elevate awareness about that. I guess one of the things, just picking back on both of that, is that time. We've put a constraints mm -hmm. upon mm -hmm. fiscal years, we've put a constraints mm -hmm. upon uh, all of this, but it is about impact over time. It is about, you know, I think what our place, what I'm hearing and what I've seen is that the impact and what the, re the revelations are happening, they're not happening that, that grant year. They're happening two, three years later in order so that we, we've seeded and now how are we growing? And the process is about time and we, requires a lot more of that flexibility. So how, yeah. I, I think I'm, I'm not astounded, but I find that my colleagues in more of my colleagues in the not-for-profit theater world in a more a sort of mainstream theater producing are always astounded that uh, Dog and Pony gets funding because, uh, you know, our newest show took, is, it took two years to make. And they're like, how did you get funded? And I said, well, we took two years to make a show. We were really open about it. And this is the process that we followed. And we invited the funders, as much as we invited, and you know, as much as we invited anyone to participate in the process of the creation, and I think you know, I, I hate to go down, start going down the road of, of saying this is any, you know, starting to to say this is anyone's problem or that there's there's any one lead to the brokenness that we're actually facing because I do agree, Sanjeet, that there's a language issue that's also leading us. I mean, I don't know that there's a cart horse at all, but when you started talking about the arts, I started thinking about, and we're now we're saying funders, so now we're saying audience versus artist, right? And then we say funders, artists, audience, staff, organization, individual artists, right? And then we start creating, or, and which is not about a siloization, but it's actually about a language, and then it gets to be this us versus them, which I, 
which I started thinking a lot about once I've been reading some articles about white people discovering their racism. Like, there's racism in Ferguson. What? I had no idea. Mm -hmm. um, that has come out as of late because of the shooting and the riots and, and everything that, is, that has happened. And so all of this is sort of tying back, which is why what your opening remarks is really is really stirring up. And I have I don't know that I'll process this or that to be able to speak to it over the course of the dinner, but is bringing up. I think it's about the language that links to the mindset that guides us mm -hmm. to where we are right now. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a lady, though. <laughs> Mm. Mm. I've been doing a little bit of reading about systems thinking, which mm. like is like a total rabbit hole. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, see the I can't even. I can't even. But there's there's one particular kind of paradigm in there. It's called success to the successful, mm. which is the idea that the more success we get on from one um, set of actions, the more we invest in that set of actions, mm. Um, mm. and that becomes a reinforcing cycle. And I think a lot of what you were talking about, about funders um, and how much the funder um, thing is project driven and, and annual driven, um, that we get good at thinking up projects um, to get funding from funders who fund projects. And it's, it's just a great example of success to the successful, whereas and I think the reason that systems language is really useful is it gives, a, it gives us language to name that that's what's happening and to make a choice about whether or not we want to be doing mm -hmm. that um, and can make a different mm -hmm. choice, I guess. And to say to a funder, I want you to invest in my organizational failure and yes. learning cycle mm -hmm. is a very different ask and takes a lot of um, courage. But I actually think that that's a very concrete thing that organizational leaders can start to do, to start to have open conversations with funders, even if that means they reject them again and again. I think that's how paradigms start to change. I think it takes, a, I was talking about this with Holly Sidford recently, it takes a lot of courage to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but at least you have control of your own courage. Right. Yes. It could also be applied internally to the way staffing works and the way department, you know, the, even the way departments are structured, the way that senior staff is relating to their junior staff. Yeah, I mean, I think that this idea of, I mean, carving out that place for whether it's courage or that kind of frank exchange. I mean, I think that there are so many similarities towards uh, in the fields that we're in with the medical industry, for example, and doctors, mm. and specifically about how do you, um, how are you really frank when you're really sucking at something in the sense <laughs> like, in the sense, and who do you talk to? Because you've got so many different, you've got funders to disappoint, you've got a community constituency to disappoint, you have your team to disappoint, you have, there's, there's so many kind of meta levels of potential disappointment and yet at the same time uh, how do you carve away that space to say either I'm really screwing things up and I need to be frank about that or and so the I, so I think that that insistence I, at least I feel like that there's an insistence to create some kind of a, a place uh, and that kind of refers to this idea the problem that you've talked about with a sense of place but specifically uh, to have those frank dialogues in in a way uh, that doesn't necessarily have everyone fleeing or jumping ship or proclaiming instability or whatever else. And that's different than kind of this idea of risk taking and reinvention. But mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think it's a necessity and it, it continues to grow to be a necessity as all these other things are starting to move around, which is that where's that space where you have that frank discussion uh, that you can really start to to really kind of you know uh, iron things out. But friends that are mm -hmm. colleagues on a certain kind of superficial level are also competitors, right? And since and mm -hmm. um, so this idea of saying, "Gosh, I'm really screwing up this grant that this foundation gave me," isn't necessarily the thing that you're actually going to talk about, but it may be exactly what you need sure. to talk about. Mm -hmm. right. this, uh, go ahead, John. But this comes up a lot with I think uh, sort of crowdsourced funding. And I recently submitted a grant, and I was like, every one of my friends is submitting a grant, and they're all doing interesting things. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to get everyone to vote for this grant, you know, and do the whole social media mm -hmm. thing. Right? And I was like, this is really tricky because they're all doing interesting things that they had done sort of a topic or something else. Maybe it'd be easier, but one person is going to win this, and we'll see what happens, right? It, it, it gets me thinking a lot about like terminology because you ask groups whether or not they want to be 501c3, 
And that answer is always like, what other choice do we have, right? You know, and so when you get down to that root, right, you're, you see there's a group in Los Angeles, the um, Coalition for Responsible Community Development. They're 501c3 for all the grants that they can get through that. They're a community development organization. They do a lot of art stuff. They've got a social enterprise arm with uh, murals and graffiti and all of these things. So it's like, how does all of this work? And they are able to balance all of that. They do interesting art stuff, and it's not in their mission. It's, it's, it's something I've been thinking about. Mm -hmm. And in, in many ways, maybe what we're all looking at is our experiments, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, life sciences focuses on this constantly, right? That's what they do. They drop a thing in, it works, something grows, it doesn't, right? You know, I have a friend who runs an arts organization in Los Angeles, and she very much runs the organization as her artistic medium. So the thing is up, down, all over the place, and I was like, it's kind of wild, but I've never seen anyone actually channel it in this way, and it's risky, but you're also doing some of the most interesting work here. And maybe it's because you allow yourself that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I've been, as, in part of, as part of Grants for the Arts, you know, there's a lot of kind of artist-driven organizations, small artist-driven organizations. And it's interesting to see they don't always have the cycle that you would expect of regular organizations, or at least dance companies. Sometimes it's... I mean, maybe like you, I'm going to kind of be more internal for a while, a year or two years, and think about my piece and kind of incubate my piece and then kind of come out. And I think, you know, and we had this kind of tense meeting where this person didn't get funding because he we didn't understand the model and he was kind of yelling at us and this is what I do and don't you get my work. And it was a real kind of wake-up call for me to really... Um, not even just understand, to appreciate the way different organizations could work and to build that into how we fund and how we think mm. about funding and what we value, really. And I think I would like to see more of a culture of learning and experimentation, organizational learning, internal learning, where people are allowed, you know, from the executive assistant to the program director to the ED, everyone can learn and make mistakes. And there's a uh, room for that, space for that. I mean, I don't see that very much, unfortunately, um, but that's something that I think would help the whole field grow. Um, but maybe it has a lot to do with power and people not wanting to, um, especially at the top, admit mistakes and perhaps let go of some power. Yeah. Um, I've been like trying to get it, like, shit, we didn't get it, no, shit, <laughs> um, but I think this a lot, like, I think, so I was at this, um, some sort of, like, professional development thing, and this very wealthy man got up at some point and said, he announced his wealth to us at some point, <laughs> so this isn't just conjecture, but, um, <laughs> he stood up and said, I just think, you know, all of you are talking about having a plan, and all of you all are talking about you know, how you want to you know, be able to look out and see where you're going. He's like, I think you all should just throw that aside. I think everyone should go to the cliff and just jump off the cliff and see what happens. So I was like, are you kidding? I was like, okay, that's easy for you to say, Mr. I don't even know what your assets are. But yeah, you can take all kinds of risks because you've got a safety net. And so I feel like when we're talking about things like people being courageous, and people mm -hmm. taking risks, and people speaking the truth to power, right? That's the whole set of mm -hmm. structures that are being mm -hmm. negotiated in order to do that, right? And I think we need to be really frank about that. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like someone just gets the gumption, like in the movie, and you just stand up and I <laughs> do protest. <laughs> and then everyone pats you on the back, and you get a medal and a million dollars at the end of that. Like, that's mm -hmm. not the reality that most people live in. And so if we're going to talk about, like, who's going to tell their funder, you know, give me money to experiment for two years is probably someone who already has a relationship with that funder. It's mm -hmm. probably somebody who like, has a clear way of speaking and presenting those ideas in a way that can be accepted. And I don't want to speak too much about funding, and I think it's probably easy for me to be the funder person and give that perspective, but I don't want to go into that space too much. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that I think we need to be honest about what makes people afraid. Because I think there are a lot of people who are really, really afraid. And I think that's legitimate. And there aren't a lot of spaces for people to talk about what makes them afraid. Um, and I think so much of the reason that people don't make the changes at an institutional level, at an individual level, whatever, is because of fear. And that's real. And, I, and we've been talking about this outside. I've been thinking about this. You know, who's going to speak truth to power? Someone with nothing to lose, right? 
maybe. Maybe they're not afraid. For whatever reason, they've created some sort of system internally, externally, that makes them mm-hmm. not afraid to lose, mm-hmm. right? But I think most of the people that we all work with and that we've been talking about and alluding to have something to lose. Mm-hmm. Um, some job. Most people don't have contracts in our field. They're working in a very precarious labor situation with very few modes for recourse, mm-hmm. right? Foundation program officers, ain't nobody on the contract that I know. So you aren't going to challenge your board and tell them, I actually think you should be doing this. I know that's totally different than everything you've been said. That's at-will employment. They could fire you tomorrow, mm-hmm. right? And I think most of us are working in that kind of context, right? And so I think legitimately what governs so much decision-making about where we're able to take risks individually, organizationally, institutionally, network-wise, mm-hmm. whatever, has to do with how we've organized power and how we have positioned ourselves to be able to do that in a structural way. Mm -hmm. Like if I have a mortgage and a baby to feed and daycare to pay for and all these things, I'm not gonna come talking some mess to my boss that's gonna get me in trouble so that I might lose my job and my health insurance. Mm -hmm. If I have a major illness, Mm -hmm. right? I was saying earlier, it would be interesting, all of us went around and said, how much money do you make a year? How much debt do you have? What is the structure of your debt? Is it forgivable? Can you consolidate it? You know, like whatever. Mm -hmm. What's your interest rate on your debt? You know, like, let's, that's so taboo. Who does that, mm-hmm. right? But when I'm sitting at that table and I'm thinking about, okay, am I going to say this? Okay, mm, yeah, I got to pay rent next month. That's religion. I need to eat and I don't have anywhere to go, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I just, I want to put that out there. I don't have anything else mm-hmm. to say right now. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it had a lot to do with something that a lot of you talked about is this kind of self preservation perpetuation of our entities Mm -hmm. thing is we're you know there's this uh, limited resources so we're always just looking to keep our organization in existence so we can keep doing our work even if we've lost the reason why we're doing it at all Um, but I it's different than your point but I think it's it's related is that we're kind of self preserving I think that's what I want to just I'm I think can I ask for some clarity yeah I tend to do that sometimes. <laughs> no, and the part no because uh, because one of course I agree like I agree with you, but two I don't agree with you. So uh, like I think people don't speak because of fear, but I'm like if I dial it up to an organizational level, I think it's bullshit what you're saying, and I think people are fearful. I think arts organizations and leaders maybe they are fearful. Like if we're saying this is conscious, right? And we are consciously not, and I know that there are arts organizations that make choices because I have heard them that say this is too risky. So we are not for X, Y, Z reason, whatever they've defined risk as. And so they're not going to do that, even though it would fulfill the mission or it would be a great, you know, it would bring in money potentially from this source or it would tap into this new audience or it would allow them to work with this group of artists or it would, you know, for a variety of reasons, right? And, um, and I think that's crap. I think that's crap. So I think that's crap. Now I think at the micro level, I think if we're in an organization and there's, a, there's an individual that's working and you are unhappy with what's happening or you have ideas and you are fearful you might lose your job, like that's not crap. Like I get that, I get self-preservation. So I'm sort of confused where, where can we get from one way, like where are you? Where are you? I think I think it operates differently, but similarly for organizations. Like I don't okay. think those are totally different conversations. <clears throat> and it may be it may be about you know a reputational thing. Sure. It may be mm-hmm. about you know. I, I I don't think I don't want to reduce everything to an economic calculus. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that I think those kinds of like security. Right, like our, our, want, our desire for security, security. I think sure. exists at an organizational level too. And I think mm-hmm. that's part of why we've been talking about this, mm-hmm. this um, continuing theme of a desire for self-perpetuation mm-hmm. is also rooted in that. Like, I, 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 there are all kinds of like, you know, things that people are talking about, behavioral economics, loss aversion, whatever you might want to say it is. Right. I think mm-hmm. those things are still operating for folks and they're real and they affect the way that we make decisions. And so certainly it's different with an organization. Yeah. But I think that, you know, people stand up with pride and say, like, we've been around for 30 years. And I'm like, that's great. And, but you don't hear anyone say, like, we did this thing for five years. It was awesome. And we quit. And it's mm-hmm. over. Like, how often do you hear people say that? 
Yeah. I know, and I and I was. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I, we, I, we had the queer, I co-founded the Queer Collective in the mid, late 90s. We lasted for three years, like queer collectives do. We blew up bad. It was, but it was also really important, I think, in terms of the history that we were at, that we had lost an entire generation of, um, of our leaders and our mentors. We were able to, because of Diverse Work's support, actually get, our mentor, get other mentors from nationally to come here, start this queer thing, create queer spaces, and then after three years, when it wasn't about a collective anymore, it was, became about individuals, then we were like, done. We need to do, and I think, and of course it took about a decade in order to be able to talk to everybody else again. Like, but I think that that was also, I, I, we recognized that there was a political action that was happening, and we did that through art, and it needed to happen, and it needed, and it, but it couldn't have lasted any longer than that period of time. Hmm. And I think that there are others that I would hope could actually say, this is the, this is the, this is why, this is where we exist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is actually painful for us to continue to make this happen. Mm -hmm. So let's now not continue to pick at that scab just mm -hmm. because we think that what we're doing is right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we are doing something right, but it's now somebody else. Well, this um, Emerging Arts Professionals, the professional development program that I co-founded for arts administrators, we're a fiscally sponsored project. We chose not to be a 501c3 because, you know, perhaps someday we'll achieve our mission and um, emerging voices will be heard and the field will move forward. But for right now, it's interesting to see there's, al there's always new people, there's new blood. It's so weird to see an idea that you had and there's people that you don't even know and they believe in it strongly. So it's still going, but I think it's interesting for you know, the people that are coming in now to contemplate that uh, we did not necessarily intend this to be permanent. It's a whole different mindset to think that way, mm -hmm. um, to be generative, but to also kind of let things go away when it's time. Maybe things sometimes serve their purpose and we don't have to be always creating institutions, mm -hmm. I think. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly an exercise I'm sure we're all familiar with from every strategic planning retreat we've mm -hmm. ever had to sit through is, you know, what would it look like if you fulfilled your mission and achieved your vision and you would, you know, go out of business. You, there would be no need for you because everyone would be happy. Um, I do, when I read the papers and, um, you know, sort of this, this notion of arts institutions existing to perpetuate themselves, for me it has never rung true. And mm. I, I feel like, you know, we sort of went around the table. We all recognize that, you know, we probably could be paid more in, in other fields, there is absolutely a differential between us and our counterparts in, in the for-profit world. Um, certainly everyone at this table and, and our colleagues and, and the you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people across the country who work in the arts have skills and talents and abilities that would transfer and scale to other industries and yet we choose this, we choose this. Um, why is that? Um, I think. If the answer isn't on an individual level and an organizational level about mission and, an, and a genuine belief in the work, then, then why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. And if your organization, no matter what size or scale, if you are not able to create a business model that is going to accommodate your legitimate human needs, um, then maybe shouldn't do it. You know, I just feel like that's a conversation that we don't have enough. There aren't enough sort of like, Hey, you want to start this nonprofit? Don't do it. I mean, as you suggested yeah. in your paper, like if you really love the bullshit, if you really want to do this stuff, then maybe this is for you. But um, I, I feel that that's an area where across the field we need more professional development. We need a better word than professional development. But how do we really? Um, how do we really just sort of prepare people for what this is about? And to do some kind of a like a gut check and go to that scary place of being really honest, not only when we're establishing new organizations, but when we're evaluating existing organizations, um, to be courageous and searchingly uh, reflective and and willing to admit when maybe what we're doing needs a radical change or maybe just to go away. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have. I want to push back a little bit okay. because I think we 
make this assumption that because we work for nonprofits, we're yes. all going to be unpaid for it. Right, no, I and don't feel like that. And there's poverty either. kind of thing. Sure. Mm. And I think a lot about the arts and sports and the intersections and the differences in mm -hmm. developing audiences. Mm -hmm. And was stunned um, to learn recently that the National Football League is a 501c3. Whoa. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. this, yeah. The head of it is making like, what, a million dollars? No. You know, more? So, like you know, we are imposing something onto our field mm -hmm. that I don't think is, yeah. right. uh, should be a Oh, no, I absolutely but, agree with that. I'll, I'll yeah. just respond to that to say that, you know, that that's another area of consciousness raising, I think, through human to human connection, um, empowerment, um, that we don't accept that. We don't accept the idea that to be artistic and creative is to be uh, poor forever. <laughs> you know, that's not acceptable. That's why I'm so encouraged by some of the social enterprise movement that's mm -hmm. happening and we're seeing encouraged at the foundation level. Um, artists really learning to advocate for themselves, to value their work, absolutely. But you know, I, I mean, I think that this is, um, I think we're almost kind of dancing around something that, that I've been trying to formulate a little bit, which is that there's, there's a, there's something that's missing here, and since then there's the, this is where I think the potential that philanthropy can really go ahead and, and come in, which is that um, on one hand, uh, we're talking about uh, leadership through change. We're talking about uh, uh, issues around risk-taking and innovation. Uh, and at the same time, um, uh, we're not allowing, we're not kind of creating some kind of a, not a net, but kind of like something to go ahead and at least slow down the fall. And I, I'll try to be a little more articulate here, which is that uh, I guess one thing that I see, and you know, sometimes people talk about that with more progressive organizations, they have sabbaticals, right? In the sense, you know, but this idea to say, how do you recharge? How do you go ahead and come back? Uh, I actually wonder if there's something a little bit deeper, which is to say, uh, how do you start to identify individuals that are not just in that philosophical kind of kind of life commitment towards the ideals and ethos around certain organizations, but to say that, look, you take the risks you need to, and if you fall through, and if your board says, whoa, this is way too crazy for me, and take a hike, or, or if for some reason that risk causes that branch to break, that there's some kind of mechanism that, that deals with the reality of day-to-day -day life, that deals with the student loan payments, yeah. that deals with the bills, that somehow says, let's keep you in the system, that yeah. you're a valued mm -hmm. part of this, of this kind of broader kind of organic milieu of creative practitioners mm -hmm. uh, that are involved in some form of structural leadership. And I guess mm -hmm. that, uh, I guess that's, that somehow kind of can pull you in and kind of keep you supported. And I, I haven't thought of it any further than that, but just something that kind of keeps you, that doesn't make you say, okay, I'm gonna start waiting tables or mm -hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm, I'm gonna kind of sour on this thing that you've committed X amount of years to. So like an infrastructure, some kind of infrastructure that keeps people in the field? Yeah, I think so. I think that because I think that there's a point in time where um, I'm assuming most of us will not be with the same organization or were not with the same organization 10 years ago or six years ago and probably don't see ourselves with the same organization in 10 or 15 mm -hmm. years from now. Um, how do you go ahead and sometimes those changes are beautiful, they're seamless. You get a title bump, you become the ED of another organization, you go ahead and do whatever else. But sometimes those, those changes come with a degree of trauma. And I guess I wonder about the mechanism. And oftentimes that trauma <clears throat> occurred while individuals were taking risks or they were part of an organization mm -hmm. that said, hey, I know the, con the economy is tanking, but we have an obligation to do X mm -hmm. and Y and Z. Mm -hmm. And I guess I wonder about that infrastructure that could exist mm -hmm. specifically for those types mm -hmm. of transitions mm -hmm. that allow people to still be mm -hmm. focused on making critical and innovative decisions. Mm -hmm. Informally, I guess I see that as my network. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I mm -hmm. came back from London, to San Francisco, I found an apartment through my network. I found um, consulting gigs through my network. So I guess th that's why I think networks are so important mm -hmm. um, and why I preach like the power of networks to the young people that I work with. Mm -hmm. um, if you can build relationships with people in the field that you respect and who respect you, I feel that uh, kind of can carry you to some extent, but I do too yearn for something that's a little bit more substantial. And I think that's why I lean towards these kind of co-working spaces that are developing mm -hmm. 
and uh, like the hub and there's a few places in San Francisco. I think those are kind of interesting models. Mm -hmm. And we've also, Ron and I were talking earlier about precariousness and how so many people are working independently in the arts and are very kind of in individualistic. And so it's easy kind of to, to fall through the cracks. So how do you address that? Should we all join the freelancers union? Is there an arts freelancers union or something like that? What kind of infrastructure? And you know, I think about it more now because in San Francisco, so many of the older artists um, who had rental spaces, didn't buy spaces. These are very respected artists who were evicted. Mm -hmm. And now they've had to move out of the city. They're totally um, displaced. What could we have done? How could we have treated these people as intangible resources um, for our community, which they are? Um, what could we have done to, to really um, to honor them and to keep them and to make the ecosystem work in that way, I wonder. I also I think that in just in terms of how can we have the ecosystem support the leadership, not only of young or emerging, but also people who have been in established organizations who recognize that they have done their part, but there mm -hmm. is no place to go. And that, that they have so much more to give, but that, the, that there are no structures, there are no opportunities for them to retire or move on or get that out of place. And I think that there, I've heard so many people, it's like, if we could find, if we could, then we would be able to make space and, and, and be also refreshed. Mm -hmm. So I think that it could happen on multiple levels of, of that field if we're gonna talk about mm -hmm, leadership. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this seems like a good time to take a quick 10 minute break, kind of rejuvenate your thinking a bit. Let's come back to this conversation and, and focus on some other things that uh, we haven't yet touched on, and then we'll finally get towards the end of the, the dinner, we'll get to some um, thoughts about that you may have as advice for people who may be listening, and things that might be able to change even just some small part of this. So let's take a quick 10 minute break. Dessert then. is ready. Dessert's ready. There's, but don't walk over there. Don't come over there. <laughs> Bryce will point, but don't. <laughs> Bryce, can walk over there. So we'll take a 10 minute break right now. I've heard a couple of thoughts. Uh, from several of you, um, that we're, it's so hard to get a handle and focus on something to kind of center our discussions, mm -hmm. and um, uh, maybe we can try to figure out how to do that. Uh, I saw a bumper sticker on a car a few years ago that I really, really liked. This is a few years ago, so the numbers aren't quite the same today, but the bumper sticker said, uh, life on planet Earth is only one six billionth about you. <laughs> and and uh, that kind of struck me, but you know, it is about me or it is about us. That's how we focus on life. It's about us. Uh, we tend to do that in the arts. Uh, every field, I think, tends to do that. Uh, it's about your organization. It's about it's about you and your career trajectory and what have you. So if I'm running a small arts organization out there. Um, these are big issues to me, and what I'm doing on a daily basis is I've got a report due Monday. I haven't started to write it. Uh, my donors are down 10%. Half of my board doesn't want to make these phone calls. Um, the audiences aren't quite what I was projecting they would be this year. I'm not sure I'm going to get those two grants. Uh, and um, I got some problems just keeping this thing alive. I don't know that I can spend a lot of time talking about some of the things that we're talking about. How can you help me? How, what can you tell me that will, will uh, help me tomorrow or the next day? One of the things we haven't talked about tonight too much is, um, is the infrastructure of our own leadership. Um, what about our leadership? Is it working? Is it not working? Is it time to move it along more? Uh, or are we still stuck in a kind of rut that we've been in? And what do we do about that? So maybe we can kick this conversation back off again um, focusing not necessarily on that, but anything you want to focus on that that maybe tries to zero in on something. Shannon, do you have some any thoughts that we can do that as we kick this second part off? Sure. I mean, w the way that I tend to think about this, living in Alaska, it's a young state, um, and we are just kind of entering a new generation. Um, and I was thinking about it, it's almost as young as the art sector, the kind of infrastructured arts, uh, arts sector that we all know. And it's the same kind of thing. A lot of the people that are now on, in leadership have been built that whole, the whole sector over the course of their careers. And, you know, 
should we just say, okay, we, we did it, we increased access, we did all the things that the NEA, when it was founded, wanted to do, do we declare victory and then move on to the next era? Um, and if so, w how does that influence the next generation of leaders in our field? Um, many executive directors that are baby boomers about to retire started and were executive directors when they were in their mid-20s. And how many of us have that experience? Um, it's a lot harder because this, the infrastructure has been built up so much. So it's a different situation in terms of um, younger people taking on leadership. And I think it has a lot of implications uh, in our field when we talk about the future of the arts sector, new models, um, and how we remain relevant in these ever-changing in, in ever times. So given that, and I do think we've been talking around leadership development a lot, and whenever we talk about something new, you're kind of talking about, you want to honor the elders, but you also are thinking like, we need something different now. We are in a new world. Uh, thoughts? So, something we were talking about over the break um, was that I think in this conversation and in our writing that we did beforehand, um, We've come up with a lot of really great language, I think, for what the kind of values um, of the of the future might be. And you had a list. We have a list. Read a couple of the things on that list. This is my nerdiness coming out. So these are um, <laughs> some of the I, I wrote themes, but in conversation with Karina, I think we could articulate them as values. Perhaps you all tell me if it's not right. But these are drawn from all of our different papers. So um, context, vulnerability openness, uh, self-reflexive praxis, so theory and practice coming together, uh, practice in general. Um, and I'm gonna riff on something also in the interim conversation, and I think it's like wisdom too, as opposed to just like knowledge that's resourced from mm -hmm. other places. It's like things we've experienced and felt in our bodies, and that gets to where I think you might be going soon. Okay, great. So um, complexity. Um, Deep questioning, discomfort, curiosity. Uh, I wrote omnivorous intellects, which is to say like seeing where we can learn in unlikely places from different people, folks, um, who in whatever ways that might challenge the, our way of thinking. And then um, partnership and perhaps unlikely partnerships. Um, so these are some of the values, if you will, that I've kind of pulled out. So just the, the idea that I was trying to pull there was, so we've identified all these really awesome things. How in the world do we move from where we are now to having this next generation of leaders actually embody those things? That was the question we were just wrestling with. And I think it's to your point about, well, what does the next generation of leadership look like? And from my perspective, I think it's leaders that embody that set of, of values. And I just, um, but you were, I interrupted you. So what were you gonna say? <laughs> I was just gonna ask for this. Mutuality and reciprocity. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But that is a good question. I mean, what does, we don't want to say professional development, but what does kind of capacity building look like um, in this era, I wonder. And also, I think on the break, or someone was talking about term limits in terms of, I mean, I know sometimes there's term limits for program officers, <laughs> but what about term limits for executive directors? Board chairs? Well, they usually are in the Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, but I know one pushback against that, though, even though I brought up the idea I'm going to push back about against myself, is in the EAP, we had this thing where the ED is only there for two or three years, but that kind of churn mm -hmm. really affects the stability of the organization. So what's like a middle ground, I wonder? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm wondering if what we actually need to be doing is looking at, I mean, speaking, let's, let's address a model that is just accepted, which is the current not-for-profit hierarchical management structure, mm -hmm. which we call leadership. Like, and we fuse management, leadership, and what I'm gonna call execution, which we can call like the entry-level positions, the people that are doing not managing or leading, right? And we sort of fuse them all together in this very mm. linear top-down structure. And it is repeated. And it, that is what is taught. Mm. 
and that is what is considered professional, and that is what is considered the way that you operate. And I don't mean from a legalistic standpoint, like the not-for-profit tax structure, which I'm gonna put over here in the, we can't blow up the tax structure, but what if we did that? <laughs> we can't. We can't. Great, so I'm gonna put it over here just to preserve uh, some semblance of government um, for tonight. So I think the first thing is, you know, what if we actually challenge or encourage starting to deconstruct that structure? Um, and that may or may not involve term limits, but what it might involve is saying, you know, why do we have these top-down structures? And I think there are smaller steps than blowing up the top-down structure, but you know, frequently you'll have an executive level, you just on a basic, right, executive level, senior staff level, and then everybody else. But the executive level is on the senior staff level. So when the executive level, when the senior staff meets, it's executive and senior staff. And then we might have everybody. But there's no cross, there's no you know, lateral and they're horizontal. There's no um, diagonal. There, yeah, there's, yeah, there's no this meeting structure as well. And so we don't have support networks within our own organization so that we're actually, I'm not saying flatten, well I am saying flatten, but I'm not saying seek, seek to find more of looking at podular structures so that we're maybe looking at trying to um, create partnerships within our organizations. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at more podular models, looking at more sharing of um, jobs that are similar or are overlapping and less task oriented, where are we siloing so that it's like you're in marketing, you're in development, you're in box office, mm -hmm. but what are the larger scopes of responsibilities that people are actually addressing, yeah. whether it's constituents, whether it's uh, constituents or types of um, relationships that we're building, um, and how are we actually working together in tandem and it's not based on who is your manager, who do you report to, and that's your department. And that might actually start all of these things that I think we do value, which is to be flip out of the box thinking, which is promoting transparency, which is promoting sort of, you know, and that, those, that is a model that we would be adopting from say the tech sector. Right. Hmm. I just wanna acknowledge that in what you just referred to, this structure that's repeated over and over again, the hierarchical flow chart that we all know so well, and that's in every, you know, nonprofit management program in this country, you don't really see the artist anywhere in no, that structure. No. Um, I think that's changing. No. Just to give an example from my experience with the Colorado Symphony, um, many years ago, I don't know how many, there was a labor negotiation that um, made it a mandate that we have musicians from the orchestra that serve as trustees on our board of directors. Um, that has done tremendous good. Um, the musicians have a voice in decisions that get made. They have um, a formal system for advocating for themselves. They understand the inner workings of the organization. They are, you know, sort of uh, liaison between their peers in the orchestra. And it's something that has been really encouraging and that I've seen and has been surprising, frankly, given yeah. the structure that um, I've all described to you, I work with them. Um, that's something that, again, just consciousness raising around how important that is. And, you know, whether it's flattening or I don't know enough about podular structures to incorporate that, but thank you, I will study this. Um, yeah, just making sure the artist always has that place at the table. I think, just, yeah, me. right. But also, just if the artist is going to be involved, what is the, what is the help, training, and support for mm -hmm. them to be taking on? that different role and responsibility, right. which mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. beyond making art. Right, right, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I think that this is... Like, we find that they do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that that's... Um, this is also kind of one of these areas where I have to say that uh, there are segments when I, I think of... when I'm in this quote-unquote field that I say kind of what the hell makes us so special, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is kind of one of those kind of ones, which is to say that to a certain degree, there's kind of a soup to nuts sense of how to communicate, how to go ahead and not be hierarchical. Uh, you know, um, knowing the fact that you may supervise someone, but how do you go ahead and, and supervise someone in a manner that's 
uh, holistic and engaging and thoughtful um, and at the same time strategic in a sense. And I guess so part of that is uh, they're just kind of fundamental kind of aspects towards uh, basic organizational transformation that you see, whether mm -hmm. it's in IT or whether you see it uh, in, uh, in NGOs or other organizations that are kind of going through similar conversations. How can we be better, be better at what we do? How can we go ahead and train individuals to go ahead and take that mantle? Uh, how do you look, work with individuals that accidentally found themselves in these positions? And, and what do you do when a significant section of your population are accidental leaders? And, mm -hmm. and, um, and again, I, I guess for me, it's, I, I, don't, I don't see that as totally being something that's completely kind of, that makes us, that makes the fields of kind of arts and cultural development special. I think that's something that you mm -hmm. see across different sectors. Um, I do think that there's an opportunity to start to go ahead and um, create a different method of approach. I think a lot of it has to do with truth telling. I think that there's um, a lot of it has to do with, uh, there's the, I think it's the Greek term parousia, which means uh, uh, fearless speech. Uh, and this idea of fearless speech, different than free speech to say anything, fearless speech is to, to who speaks the truth and to where. And I actually think a lot of the fundamental issues that we have is this idea of how truthful we are uh, in whatever sector that we're involved with. So, Kuni, you were mentioning just, I, I guess what you're asking us, Barry and Shannon, is how to operationalize all of this, right? And make it useful to someone who's watching and going through this. And I think about how people get involved in in the arts, whether it's as being an artist or an arts administration, right? And very few people probably as a child say, one day I'm gonna work in arts administration, I work in community theater, right? <laughs> Same thing in my field, very few people say, one day I'm gonna be an urban planner. There's something that happens, you grew up in public housing, whatever it was, and it made you think about the topic in a certain way. And so in Los Angeles, we have the Getty Multicultural Undergraduate Internship Program, which is fantastic, and I went through it twice. And then the County Arts Commission, headed by Laura Zucker, um, they have the performing arts side. So Getty does the visual arts, literary arts, County does performing arts and media arts and botanic gardens, all these things. And so combined, it's like almost two, 300 undergraduate interns. And I worked after having gone through this program, helping manage the program. And my boss at the time, Andrew Campbell, told me, our job is not really to train the next level of arts administrators. Our job is to get arts advocates out, whether they want to be artists and arts administrators, that's great. But maybe the better goal is to get them and then have them be the doctor, have them be the lawyer, and have them serve on the board, have them give money, be season subscribers to whatever, have them be the donor that gives you the money to start your small arts nonprofit, right? And I thought this was really interesting because I think we've talked a lot about how do we go and sort of adopt something from another sector that might be working better, has more resources, but we're almost maybe trying to like, you know, get arts advocates and create this kind of mole, but that allows us or forces us maybe to not be afraid of losing someone on our team because we're trying to mm -hmm. keep it really insular, right? Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, they're a lawyer. That's cool, but they're gonna make a lot of money and maybe they're gonna give you this. Um, there's also this sort of idea that's this like perpetual arts in crisis thing. And I think I see it every time I get like an email from an arts advocacy group, I'm like, oh God, what's going on now, right? It's like, it's like, it's the last dollar. It's like, it's really bad, right? And, and, and I get it, but I think externally, when other sectors view what the arts is going through, maybe it looks like we're disorganized or that we haven't planned and that we're more proactive or reactive than proactive. And it, it, someone told me this, they're like, just the arts always looks like the ship is burning. Like, why isn't, like, you guys have so many other things to talk about, but you always focus mm -hmm. on the negative. Right. And um, maybe the last thing I'd say is, um, you know, thinking about artists on um, boards um, makes me think about maybe we have this fear of forcing an artist to be in something that might be like, you know, contributing, right, you know, fundraising board. An artist is like, oh, I can't give you the $20,000 you need. But how do you switch that and say, okay, but you have a skill of creativity. Could you create a couple of pieces for the annual fundraiser, right? Mm -hmm. And that is monetized in a different way. Thinking about the way we look at money or, or value in a different way is maybe the, the stream there. We're recontextualizing currency and assets in general. Like exactly. the, the concept of currency beyond one that is like naming money as right. currency right. and what is the currency that all of yeah. us bring, looking at the assets, 
yeah. more on a broader scale of what assets yeah. actually are. Yeah. Yeah, and then it ruins purposely this whole idea of like the poor artist, the like starving right. artist. It's like, why does it always have to be? And why is the artist like, I'll take it. I know you're going to pay me five bucks, mm -hmm. but I'll take it because right. there's nothing else, right? Which is why I think we find a lot of like really positive results from looking at like everyone. Everyone is a genuine ambassador yeah. and everyone is a participating artist. So if we, if we contextualize every single person that's ever involved with us, with Dog and Pony, as a participating artist, always, that completely changes you know, the value statement. It completely changes the, the everyone's currency. How, how does it do that? How? Because, because when you, I mean, on a very simple level, and this is how I was taught to, to fundraise, right? When I'm going to a funder, when I'm going to someone to ask them, so Barry, I want to tell you about a really great company, and I'm asking you to write a check towards us. It's, it needs, I need to think about that because I'm inviting you into the artistic process. But for us, the artistic process is not a precious process. It's not a closed off one. Nothing secret is happening in the rehearsal room, which means I also need to be more transparent to open that door. If you want to come in, come in. Come in and watch. God forbid, come in and tell me what you think about what's happening and that that's okay. So there's all sorts of, and I don't, every, every organization's process is going to be different. And ours is a little too inclusive for a lot of other people, so I'm not going to put that on anybody else. But I think that's about the mindset. It's, a, it's about how we choose to frame it. And then if we're, again, it's how, if everyone is embracing that, it opens up the mind mm -hmm. possibilities to how you're looking at the world. It changes the frame. And I think that, I mean, I think that this idea of examining what would inherently be seen of as a liability and really see it yes. as, a, as an opportunity, yes. and since as a wall to climb over, and since uh, as something to drill through. I mean, I, you know, anecdotally, um, we used to do, before I arrived at SFAI, we used to do open studios, and they were kind of, they were monthly events, which were an opportunity for our artists and residents to open up their studios. Um, their attendance varied, and since, um, we ended up um, more formalizing something that we did three times a year, and, and this is something called SFAI 140, where we had, where we have our artists in residence present alongside innovative members of the northern New Mexico community. Um, so we're bringing an audience as presenters all of a sudden. So the idea is that there may be nine artists in residence, and we'll have eleven local presenters. So this idea of creating that 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 a hazy boundary between audience member and participant, yes. and this idea of then having a greater degree of investment. Because we're also mm -hmm. pragmatic, realizing that people are going to come in because they're going to see their friend Bob present about his Obsidian right. project or, uh, or something else. And there, there are 140 second presentations each, and we do 20 of them mm -hmm. in one evening. And, and there is something about how do you go ahead and look at these liabilities, or how do you look at these things? And, and I think that, you know, riffing on what I guess John said, I think as a MIT alma mater myself, that there's there's something about the problem set mentality, which is, which is actually fundamental. It, it, it is, in the sense that you create a problem set, you problematize something, and that's a great way to go ahead and not kind of slip into that categorization of feeling like you're a part of a larger culture of victimization or something. But you, you problematize something, you understand the scope of your capacity, and then you try to go at it. It's back to, and Ron was asking this question earlier about like the loss, and we're talking about fear, and it's like, I have so much to lose. But I think we frequently don't find the questions like, what do we have to gain mm -hmm. from taking this risk? Mm -hmm. And if you can start like really getting that huge list of gains, the losses seem, mm -hmm. can start to seem inconsequential. Even when the losses are do dollars, which are mm -hmm. really fucking consequential. I just, I also want to offer, um, humbly, because my scope of knowledge is not gigantic around this, but, you know, as we're listing these, um, to these values and as we continue to offer them into the space, I think that there are examples, right? And mm -hmm. I think we probably all know at least a handful, right, of organizations or individual leaders who exhibit these qualities. Mm -hmm. um, like, I think about... Um, so one of the things I'm thinking about is like, what about like cooperative models, which is kind mm -hmm. of what Dog and Pony is doing, right, of, of running arts organizations as opposed to the hierarchical models where everyone's an owner and I think, you know, mm -hmm. adjusting that kind of language. Um, but I, I think about something like um, alternate roots and their structure mm -hmm. where 
the board of directors is every member of the organization. Mm -hmm. And they do have some delineation between the executive committee that meets on you know, some more regular basis or has other kinds of responsibilities. But the idea is that everyone who is a member, and they're all artists, they're all activists that are practicing their art in a community context, are stakeholders in the decision making of the organization. Their strategic plan is everyone participates, right? I mean, to the extent that I would assume that one wants to, mm -hmm. right? And so I think, you know, we do have examples of other structures of leadership. I think questions then, getting back to the context, is that why are some of those models being resourced and why are others not, right? Mm -hmm. You know, which organizations that are doing something in a funky way that makes people mm -hmm. uncomfortable um, are actually able to marshal the resources they need to do their work at scale or at the depth or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I look at something like uh, Allied Media Projects and the way that they run their mm -hmm. conference, which is kind of an open source model. They develop mm -hmm. a framework and they have a process and they have a zine that helps people understand the expectations around mm -hmm. creating and presenting a workshop during their conference. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's they, they're to the point that Karina was mentioning earlier, it's about a process. They've created this rigorous process, mm -hmm. right? And then they open it up to anybody to offer ideas for a track at their program. So I think that we do have examples currently operating in our field, not even historic ones, like ones that are visible and present, um, that we can all be learning from. And if we can articulate these values and say, like, we want to exhibit these, we want to embody these, there are individual, organizational, and probably network-based um, active practices that are happening right now. And I think part of what our field needs to do is start to really lift those up and highlight them as exemplars of you know, contemporary practice, mm -hmm. maybe not best practice, what are good ideas, no, well, you know, <laughs> things that people yeah. can learn from and repurpose as needed in their context, whatever the, the right. I can offer another example. Idea. I think it's so, it like fills my heart to hear a real example of someone embodying these values. Right. You're right. Um, one of the organizations that we've worked with is the International Contemporary Ensemble ICE, and they mm. were an organization that went from being really small and scrappy to being really big, um, mm. pretty fast. Um, and they, in their initial phase of growth, kind of started to grow up into a traditional siloed organization where there were the artists and the administrators. And um, they came into the Innovation Lab program, which is the program that we do, because they wanted to rethink all of that and ended up um, going through a, a really amazing process to have musicians become musician partners and have the musician partners run the organization. And it, it required a certain letting go. I mean, there were people in, who had been steadfast members of the ensemble that were not on board with that. And they, a break had to happen. And I think that's really, really difficult. But now, it's not only like an artist-centric or an artist-inclusive, or it's like a whole artist organization. Um, and I think it embodies so many of those, mm. those values. And it takes a certain kind of enterprisingness and you're right, there are some organizations that I think have the privilege to be able to have the time and space to, to do that, but it definitely is possible and I'm so encouraged by examples of it playing, playing out already. These are not actually future values. These are now values. These are contemporary mm -hmm. yeah, totally. values. Can I go back, I wanna go back to this leadership, the, the model, the, I wanna go back to something I'm obsessed with. Um, <laughs> Is this, I'm reminded, so when I was first working um, in education in nonprofit theater, so in the education department at that time, like I was expected to be an administrator, a creator of programs, and a teaching artist. Mm -hmm. um, that's a ridiculous skill set to ask of one person um, because they're three totally different jobs, right? So, um, so I'm thinking about this separation again between leadership, management, and being able to like do something. And is one of the things that we might wanna also be looking at if we are looking to dismantle slight, or slightly dismantle or adjust structures to that are in current models, so not blow up the model, but to change it, is to actually look at subdividing some of these jobs up so that instead of looking at um, a managing director position, and I'm making this up, that is expected to lead and manage and actually do certain tasks, like write grants, like be an excellent grant writer, which is a huge specific task, right? And marketing copy and whatnot, and is supposed to manage these certain tasks and deal with all the like 
HR and and personality conflicts and whatever, and actually have long term visioning things. Like those are three completely different skill sets, and to actually have to engage in them on an everyday basis is mind boggling. So what are the other what what is what are is another approach that we can actually look to that is embracing of these values or is embracing the fact that that doesn't function anymore. Mm-hmm. That structure doesn't function anymore. I mean, part of that is, for me, I think about a, a market shift from what I like to think of as the, from the DIY movement to the DIT movement, in mm-hmm. a sense, from the do it yourself to the do it together. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have to say that I, I, I'm semi-optimistic um, um, about opportunities for that because I think you even see it within innovative forms of, of education structure is this idea of kind of collaboration and collaborative learning and this idea of kind of sharing responsibilities and I, and I do think that I do think that there is there's a greater degree of acceptance now in issues around uh, collaborative strategic wayfinding and collaborative leadership models than there was probably, I think, 10 or 15 years mm-hmm. ago. I mean, I five. think that that's... Five, five, five. five. four, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, I mean, I, and I guess I think that, so, so I think that in some ways, I think that there is that. I think one still mm-hmm. goes ahead and says, where's the rigor within this? And, but mm-hmm. also, and then, and that goes back to, I think, this idea around honesty. Um, mm-hmm. I'm really good at four out of the seven things you're asking me to do, instead of pretending for mm-hmm. fear of losing your job and losing him, mm-hmm. but to be able to go ahead and say, I'm really good at these four things. <laughs> We're gonna need to figure out someone else that's really good at these three things. Mm-hmm. Uh, or it was also, I guess part of my the question is just in, in reality, as much as what I'd love to hire mm-hmm. multiple people right. in order to do this, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm we have to deal with the fact that it still is embodied in generally within one person. And so I think that there was te- techniques of like, what are those, those roles? How are you spending enough time in each one of those roles in mm-hmm. order to make sure that you, it, it's never enough. It will always be kind of a compromise situation, but at least on a simple basis, I have these different roles. Have I spent enough time in that today and mm-hmm. this week so that I can get through this fiscal year in order to make that happen? Um, but it was also in terms of going to the, the, the tasks and, and skills when Diane Barber and I were became co-directors of Diverse Works, we recognized, we came, we were curators, we were in the communities. There are parts that we did not know there, are part, but those parts we didn't actually ask for help in. And the board also didn't help us figure out what those things were. So I think that those are the parts where if we go into this, like it, how, how are we finding those resources, whether it's in ourselves or in somebody else, in order to address those, those deficiencies, or not deficiencies, those current areas of exploration and need. And, like, and how, how are we doing that? Is it consulting for a short period of time, or how is it my mentoring? How is it that the skill base, because we are expected to know way too much to get through the day, mm-hmm. Can we make that happen? That's interesting, like fitting that process of exploration into the position, articulating it into the position, making space for it in the position. I mean, and I'm wondering for these leadership jobs of the future, how, how can you train? I mean, what are the levels of training or engagement it takes to embody like this list of <laughs> of features that Ron's created. Right. I mean, it seems like, I mean, maybe it involves uh, internships and training programs. Maybe it involves some kind of ED circles or learning circles, some kind of knowledge sharing. I mean, I'm wondering, especially for the people who have held leadership positions, I mean, what kind of training would you want to make you the leader of the future. Mm. And I'll think about it myself while I'm asking you, but I'm, mm. I'm wondering. I mean, I think part of it's, for me, and, and it's not too disassociated with, with this idea of us being more globally interconnected, but it's mm. about being multilingual in the sense mm. I mean, I have to say that it seems more and more the ability to speak the language of economics, the ability yeah. to speak the language of entrepreneurship, the ability to speak mm-hmm. the language of yeah. design, mm-hmm. the ability to speak the language uh, of innovation in addition to going ahead and saying 
that um, I speak, one speaks the language of artistic processes or creative-based mm -hmm. processes that are inherently bound in history and tradition, um, but the ability to go ahead and and feel flexible because I think the mm -hmm. the normal audience as this kind of passive is kind of out the window. I think this the mm -hmm. norm of the academic structure um, uh, as not being involved or being involved only conduited through kind of a cultural organization is also out the window. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that, um, mm -hmm. and this kind of goes back to my my think of saying what makes us so special, which is to say that um, you know. Um, the, the world has become that kind of more complex and intrinsic idea and that we have as much to steal ideas from within mass marketing tools of a corporation that we may vilify on our own but say, <laughs> damn, that was a really cool yeah, idea yeah. in the sense. And, I, and so I guess I feel like it is about being multilingual on one level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the facilitator, I think the leader of the future is a facilitator. Mm -hmm. I think the leader of the future is a facilitator and a process designer. I think mm -hmm. as we move from this old notion of heroic leader, the person who has the vision out ahead and who everyone is clamoring behind to follow and to serve, I think the leader of the future is the person who can make voices heard, who can make safe space, who can bring unusual groups of people together, who can give groups permission um, to talk and listen openly. I just think that that's such an essential skill set for the future. I guess uh, just a little part of where you know I've been thinking about. We are a generation of visionary managers. We we facilitate. We bring people together. But it's also that vision. It is that like I, I love the fact that you added the process designer yeah. because it has to be about a mm -hmm. a vision and a, a, yeah. and the future thinking. Right, right. Because the facilitation and the other, which I think our generation is really great at. But how do we also then take that to? You facilitate. You have to facilitate a process you've designed towards something, something specific that has. You're not a neutral facilitator. You're not neutral about process. Right. You have a point of view about process mm -hmm. and where it's going. But you were going to say something. Sorry. Yeah, I think to that point, I think we've been talking a lot about how arts administrators, advocates, artists can help other artists, ad administrators, advocates, right? But I think there's a group in this whole audience that maybe we're not talking about. We're also not talking about what people who depend on our services are not getting because whatever model is broken, right? I mean, and you're talking about people who aren't artists, maybe families, low-income communities, maybe ethnic minorities who are just coming because they're, they want to see something cultural, artistic, right? And like, how have we failed them? Because right now we could be a little bit more self-serving and saying, how do we help ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And I think this gets into some of the, you mentioned the Sixto, you mentioned this, Ron. Um, something's broken there as well, I think. Well, one of the things that I noticed um, is some of these really cultural rooted um, arts activities are not f on the radar of state arts agencies. And is that a problem because they don't need our funding do we need to make them dependent on us or how can we support them otherwise but I think we tend to think so myopically about well we can give you a grant to do this and then you'll need us even though what you're doing is already totally vibrant and connecting with your community exactly I mean it's that word too right I mean if I look at my neighborhood where I grew up in East LA and you're like okay so you've got informal street vendors selling food people are getting together it's this like parking lot in a bank that no one's used, it's an abandoned lot. I think this is what they call creative place making. And these people are never <laughs> gonna, I, I, these people are never gonna right. apply for that grant. Right. They don't even yeah. know what that term yeah. is or that money is out there, right? But if you said, we're basically just helping you do what you're already doing, mm -hmm. but you're just not on our radar. Huge missed component. And this is the everyday life of people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Within our infrastructure, to get to the of what several said. of you have been alluding to, what stands in the way of that happening at this point? So, someone earlier on mentioned the, that we're dealing with a, um, a culture of failure avoidance, which uh, obviates against risk taking. We are predominantly a 501c3 structured field. Um, boards of directors take their roles. Um, in their own minds very seriously, and, and they see results as the, um, as the proof in the pudding, as it were. Without the results, then the wrong kind of leadership. What, what structurally has to change to get to the point that 
you guys have been talking about in terms of allowing the freedom to have this new leadership. I mean, I wonder if it's restructuring what's there and the organizations that aren't working are really just lifting up these organizations that are working, giving them more prominence. And that doesn't just mean money, um, but I don't know, a larger, larger place in the field, larger emphasis, thinking of them as new models, looking at process. Seeing it as a process, I think. Seeing it as, I don't want to call it an evolution. Um, How are we encouraged that? It seems arrogant. Sorry. Shouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, so, um, I, mean, I, I guess I wonder if part of this is about just kind of the degree of intentfulness to which we approach and how do we cultivate a degree of intentfulness. And I, I won't be so oblique. I mean, just, what I mean by that is that part of this is about how do you reconnect disconnections, right? Since how do you reconnect the idea of the, the ED that has lost any sense of the fear and anxiety and work that goes into actually deploying a program in the sense? And, and part of that could be, and that may not be something that everyone has to contend with, but it may be something with an honest evaluation to say, I am disconnected from that. Um, or that ability, I guess, to go ahead and see that um, that yeah, I'm not I'm not as invested in these dialogues, and so I guess that I guess that territory of frankness is one of the mm -hmm. things that I think it's really important. It's not um, it's not decisive. It's not deliberate. I remember in I remember in grad school when I was getting my MFA that I thought it was so weird that I would take art history advanced seminars, and as a studio artist, I would be in there with art historians. And, as a grad student in the MFA program, you had to take X number of art history classes, but it was weird that none of the art historians had to take any studio classes. Mm -hmm. And you were, you were like, you're educating a group of, of, of art historians that have no connection with what it's like to go ahead and do a lithograph or to go ahead mm -hmm. and throw a vessel or to do anything. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I kind of really, I get concerned about that intentional institutional sense of disconnection. Mm -hmm. and so I think that, I guess I would say that the first thing would be about seeing, going through some kind of a process to say, where are you disconnected? And then how do you, how do you go ahead and reconnect that? And I think that's really an apparatus of being, of custom fit. Because I, I think it's, I don't think it's a one size fits all mm -hmm. policy. I think it's more of a philosophy that needs to be kind of introduced and encouraged. Mm -hmm. So I think so, we also just in three, we have 360 evaluations, and so that, mm -hmm. that actually you will have people tell you where you are disconnected. Right, exactly. as well. mm -hmm. And I think that, that we already have that mechanism. We have it. How, why are we not employing that mm -hmm. more often? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's about being reflective and being honest. I mean, that's a good place to start. I would, oh. Oh, yeah? Okay. Um, <laughs> I, um, thank you. So I, I guess I want to make sure that we're, all right, we, we're talking about the future and I just want to say it's now. It's like people are saying climate change is not tomorrow. It's now, like this is now. So let's talk about this as if it's like what needs to happen now or what is happening now, what even has preceded this but never got raised and visible as again, I want to like, this is all existing contemporaneously then, now and there. So that's one thing I'd like to say. Um, the next thing is I, I think a lot of Barry, to your point about, like, so what would it require to do this is time. And mm -hmm. we've been talking about time. I was asking Karina about the EMCR it's the innovation model, and she was sharing that, you know, it requires a lot of time. It requires three days, and then a week, and then another mm -hmm. three days, and you have to pay people through that. So it's an expensive endeavor, right, to, to just shake it up enough that people can like, see what the thing mm -hmm. is, to name the, the complex problem enough to start to work on it. So I think legitimately, we should be talking about like how would we give, but how would people get the time mm -hmm. to do this mm -hmm. work, whether it be institutionally mm -hmm. or otherwise? Like, where's that time coming from? And again, I want to put that back in this context of time is money for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, the expense is paying those people to do that work, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least creating the conditions that they can leave for a while and come back, right? So even if we're talking about a small organization or a large organization, who's going to pay for people to have the time? To do this, so we could talk about, you know, maybe funders need to create a bigger fund, and EMC Arts needs to work with smaller organizations. Not to put an onus on you to do something specific, right? But you know, I think that we could talk about these things. But we get then we get back into this place of reliance on specific kinds of sources of capital. Mm -hmm. So where do I think the other thing is like where do we get enough funds 
to pay for people to do this work, right? And so I guess I'll offer <laughs> two things. I, Are you I think, offering to pay for this? No. I'm not, I'm not, the Rausenberg, Thanks, the Rausenberg Foundation is not offering that. that like, I'm not saying that as a funder. Like, we don't have the funds to do that, frankly. Um, but, you know, I think... I think there's things like what does cultural self-determination look like in that context so like John when you were talking about the folks who are creating space in a parking lot where people are coming together and eating and gathering and sharing like that's a fairly self-determining space I would say that rather than folks um, saying like oh can we give you money maybe we prevent the police from coming in and breaking up this gathering that you know because people are being policed or maybe we say like you know what people don't need permits to cook this food right. you know maybe that's where government entities could intervene as opposed to making people reliant on resources to just do the thing they were doing right remove the fear of being policed from the gathering that's happening right remove the barriers um, so I would like to frame that in as important the, the self determination piece is really important, and then the second thing is you know talking about this in terms of changes in time and space for people um, is uh, i don 't know how to quite say this mm. how do we self organize to make that possible i guess that 's my thing like without relying on funders to pay for it, mm -hmm. like what would that really require? And or and or if it's not to today, um, may, what what's the vision to get there? So for example, it might be easier for us to do this if everyone had access to healthcare. Maybe people wouldn't be so afraid. Maybe if people had secure housing, maybe this wouldn't be so precarious. Maybe if people didn't have to worry about their freedom of movement, this would be easier. Maybe folks who could take a long distance learning class who live in a very unwired place in the middle of the country could get access to broadband. You know, I think there are some things, and this is what I wrote about but haven't really talked about, that we could be organizing in community with other folks and address this issue that affect artists, that affect administrators' ability to do their work, to take these risks, to grow in the ways that they need to grow. And, and I, I think that we need, as a field, to be more actively engaging in that process for a way to create the conditions that allow us to have this visionary leadership in practice. And I think that's a longer term set of struggles, but I think we need to be organizing and active now in order to make that possible. And future. I think when I talk about infrastructure, that's what I mean. That's the infrastructure we need so that the field can look at itself, that um, it can, mm. we can start to address issues like cultural equity and other, you know, a variety of people from different incomes and different cultural backgrounds who be a part of the arts, be a part of the arts community. And diversity isn't just like butts and seats, but it's uh, much more holistic. Than and that. I think that's what partially, and, and, and I think that as folks who are creative practitioners, who have a rigorous creative practice, who have processes that take blank things and make beautiful stuff with them, you know, like what have you, um, that, that we have something to offer for those change making yes. processes. It's not like we come in and be like, we're the cute little artists who are just going to sit here and be like, yeah, that's great. You know, I think that we have skills and processes and tools and models to offer um, for change making processes in the communities in which we live, in which we work, in which we make our art, right? And so we come as people with assets. And I wrote humbly in my paper because I do think this is a shift. In, this would be a shift in practice for a lot of people. But there are artists who are already working this way. Again, there mm -hmm. are models. There are people. There are good ideas that are already mm -hmm. functioning. So I also think it's not a blank slate. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a lot mm -hmm. to work with. Yeah. And how can we think of the wealth that we have? I think. I think that's a very good point. We are wealthy in many ways. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we're we're starting to get close to the end now. Um, so. What I'd like to do is give everybody uh, at the table a chance to, to um, share a final thought or um, a, a singular point. Um, I see, I agree with what you said, I see, every week I see a half a dozen to a dozen projects that are working wonderfully, great projects, they're doing everything right. They're not necessarily replicable across the field, but they're great projects because there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, building on what you said earlier, Ron, about doing things now, um, the one thing that is the common lament that I hear across this, this sector is that um, the public doesn't value the arts. 
to the extent anyway that we need their valuation to give us the things that we need to continue to succeed. I don't know what the field's going to look like 25 years from now, uh, but if you were to suggest something, something the arts should do today, now, so that 25 years from now, that valuation would be much closer to what we want it to be, what would you say? You don't have to use that as an example for your final thought, but maybe that might be helpful to some of you. And I think we could just stop with John and go right around the table, if that's okay with you. I'd say three, four minutes each, and, that, and, and then we can have some kind of wrap-up. I think within the last half hour, I've just been thinking a lot. There's this dichotomy, sort of, the, the the grant recipient and the grantor, right? I think that we've been sort of talking about the beneficiary and the one that has the, the cash. Um, I think one quick thing, not a quick thing, but one main thing maybe we can do, and these are all uh, recommendations I think mainly for like the funding agencies, whether they're nonprofit or public agencies, is longer grants. I think that grants are so short, the one year, the two year, I know that's sort of been a trend but Sixto was saying this too, like it takes a long time before you get there. And if all this process is part of the process, then, um, then I think we need to leave time to not just do it, but evaluate it too, and have the time to risk and fail and, and to go back to the grantor and say, hey, I tried something, it's not working. Don't take the money, but I have another idea, right? Um, maybe that will decrease some of the, the fear. Um, two, maybe there could be some kind of like sort of risk score challenge grant for something maybe even termed in this terminology where it's like <laughs> it's okay to mess up this time like and it's sort of like a wash and you know you see this with some foundations giving these like program related investments and it's like okay if we don't get it back it's fine in these grants um, um, I, I know they probably don't appreciate that much but I think there has to be a larger incentive that maybe is in, in the traditional sort of this is our annual grant making cycle and this is the you know large organizations grant cycle opening today kind of deal. Um, the third one is something I've been thinking about a lot. There are a lot of groups that continuously go back to the same funder, right? And they're eligible, so they do it. Um, what if you sort of set up this knowledge share where if you're a large organization um, and you receive money in one year, the next year, if you apply and you receive the money, part of the condition of you're getting that money is doing something technical assistance based. And I know that's a really kind of wonky term, but doing something where like, hey, we have some new grantees and this is their first time. So like, we need you to kind of help shadow them, lead them through this process. Or, and, and maybe that grantee, the new grantee, everyone writes something specific in this grant application. We're doing this program, blah, blah, blah. By the way, this is our big challenge this year, whatever it is. And then you get matched with someone who's like got money and you know that other group can't get money until they fulfill this part of the bargain. Not to force someone to work together, but hopefully start a network that maybe can live outside of this formal means, right? Mm -hmm. You can do that with smaller organizations too. I just think there has to be something more because half of the groups that get the money are the same groups and they have the resources to do that and they can pay the grant writers and they've got the development team, right? You know, and then you've got the small group that is the one you know, person shop is doing everything, right? And I think there has to be a larger incentive there. So I won't take the three minutes, but that's something that is on the mind. Oh, a lot of thoughts. This has been a really interesting conversation. Um, you know, I came prepared to sort of advocate an idea that now seems fairly pedestrian. You know, the notion that within the administrative infrastructure, within the organizational, organizational structure, we should have identified roles for people whose job and role it is to uh, lead innovation, for lack of a better term, um, to scan the field for good ideas, to push back against bad ideas, um, and to have some freedom to um, sort of take that role of discoverer, maybe, and, and bring them back and sort of vet those ideas. That doesn't answer the question that's been raised. You know, we've all talked about, well, if we could, we would have more people, and of course, um, how do you do that? I don't know. I don't have the answer without it suddenly magically um, growing the field of resources. I do believe that, you know, in the same way that you would not envision having a symphony produced without having a conductor, if we start to change um, the way that we construct um, 
organizations that there are some roles that are non-negotiable. I like this idea around sort of leading with needs and responsibilities rather than roles that just get perpetuated over and over again. Um, you know, to the question of how do we make the case to the average person who is maybe not connected that the arts are valuable, um, you know, to, to people around this table that's intrinsic and obvious. I do wonder and worry sometimes about this idea that the arts should do everything. Um, I love what you're saying about activating people around getting involved and advocacy and, and connecting with social justice and all those kinds of things, but we can't do everything. We don't have those skills. That's a different set of school, skills from commissioning a work of theater. So that's an area where I see it being vitally important that partnership, um, that's a place where partnership and sort of building alliances makes a lot of sense. I do want to maybe offer a word of caution about um, collaboration and that's something that we see as such a, you know, sort of a, not so much a mandate from funders, but it's something that we see encouraged more and more and I think it's wonderful and we do it all the time and I'm a, a definitely a fan of it. But I think there's a danger there too that I see starting to creep up more and more that you're sort of seeing these collaborations come together that are not really natural. Um, I think it's important that organizations have the courage of their convictions to be who they are and not necessarily commit unnatural acts. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes when you put when you put people together, if you have a major theater company and like a small experimental mime theater because it sounds like a cool idea, they're gonna have a very different perspective on like, well, when is that money coming in? You said that was due and we haven't gotten it yet. So I've seen that happen. I've had experience with that. So that's just sort of maybe a caution I would put out to whoever's listening. Um, and then I would say something that I've heard over and over again tonight is, how do we engage in more meaningful dialogue with the funding community? Um, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of um, cultural change that we're asking of the funding community and things that we want them to understand about our values, including the value for experimentation. How do we uh, initiate and sustain that conversation? Uh, I'm just gonna be really brief, because I'm still kind of processing. Would like greater recognition that the future is now, the future is happening as mm -hmm. we speak. It's not something distant. We are living in it. I mean, as a little kid, and I couldn't imagine 2014, but here it is, <laughs> here. Um, I'd like to see more of a culture of experimentation and prototyping where failure is fine. Failure is even encouraged. Failure is part of learning. Mm -hmm. I don't know where this happens. I mean, I don't know if it's like, arts administration programs or capacity building, or maybe there are more smaller grants for people to experiment mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily part of established organizations, but, um, um, you know, I don't want to say punks, radicals, but people who, um, people who this kind of um, activity, it's part of their, their being. I mean, maybe they will be kind of the new leaders that can help set this trend. Because I think it's, I just have a hard time imagining institution as they exist now, um, really embracing that spirit. And there have been several, I think, innovation grants that have come out in California. And you never hear about the results because mm -hmm. nothing quite happens. And so maybe we need to start looking outside of those places to encourage this, to help this bubble up. I'd like cities, states to think more about infrastructure, infrastructure for artists and the arts and what that looks like, and cultural equity, a deeper investment in equity, a more progressive idea of what equity is. I mean, to me, I think it has a lot to do with investing in leadership, investing in young leaders, um, maybe even there's a lot more programs around um, uh, technology and cultural equity, around social enterprise and cultural equity. I mean, maybe arts um, should start to be part of those efforts. I can see a lot of cross-pollinization there. Yes. Um, and just more kind of self-organizing around alternative economies and alternative structures. Um, more thinking that maybe creative enterprises are part of this community and not always on the outside. So I think, uh, yeah, that's it from me. <clears throat> um, I think the things I'm thinking about probably under the larger umbrella of this 
idea of cultivating intentionality. Uh, and that, uh, that idea is really, I mean, I'm assuming everyone has a degree of being intentional here, but, um, but this idea of saying that how do you go ahead and create a system of checks and balances that make sure that you're not doing things because you've done them in the past or you're not doing things because that's where revenue is, mm -hmm. um, but that you're able to go ahead and kind of apply kind of a, a rigorous sense of, uh, of ethics, but also just also a rigorous sense of kind of, of self-evaluation that says mm -hmm. um, that this is where one needs to be. A couple ideas that come to mind for doing things that can occur immediately. Uh, one is based upon conversations here, is some kind of a truth lab or something. Maybe that's the worst <laughs> name for it. But this idea of saying that how do you create this environment which is a safe space among cultural practitioners to really talk really yeah. openly and frankly about uh, not their successes but their failures. And not to over-aggrandize their failures in kind of a hybridic way, but, but to really actually look at their failures yeah. in a frank way to gain feedback mm -hmm. and to say, crap, I really screwed up and I wonder what I can do and, 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 and to really have that, because that's knowledge sharing too, mm -hmm. right? And, since, and I think we have to go ahead and talk that the dissemination of failure and the ability to understand that kind of retrieval process from failure is a form of knowledge sharing. So that's, I guess, one thing that, the second thing is, is kind of a cross between, I think, kind of, I don't know, it's like poker and riding in a Humvee or something like that, <laughs> which is just that I, I do wonder about I do wonder about the nature of this idea of thinking about um, about embedding, and specifically, mm -hmm. and I think of, um, I, I actually think that uh, I think that there should be uh, a relationship. One way that you change the dynamic between philanthropy uh, and innovative cultural organizations is by changing the relationship of where they are on that field. And I, mm -hmm. I actually think the idea of having a program officer actually being embedded into a mm. cultural organization for six months mm. um, to truly yeah. understand has a great opportunity to mm. transform the, the worldview uh, of that philanthropic organization as well as have that opportunity for exchange. That the other, and that's true vice versa too. The idea of a program, the the idea of a program associate or a program assistant in a in a nonprofit going ahead and actually spending. X amount of hours within uh, a philanthropic organization to understand their worries and their fears and their day-to-day -day mundaneness is something I think could be really ripe and it's kind of immediately doable mm -hmm. to a certain degree. I yeah. think it requires a little bit of juggling. Um, the other half of that is really about kind of closing the door and and and, and kind of and locking the locking the door and and, and having a, a more in-depth period of time with people that want to play. And by that, mm -hmm. what I mean is that. Um, Get um, get three individuals that run innovative cultural programming, and get the EDs in the room along with individuals from public policy and individuals from philanthropy. Close the door, provide food, maybe water, and um, and, it's like, and and what you go ahead and do is say that everyone comes to play. Everyone says, as an ED, I'm willing to devote over the next six months 15 percent of my staff hours to making something work. Uh, as a philanthropic philanthropic organization, you're willing to pony up $25,000 to do this. Create a meaningful, targeted series of pilots that specifically revolve, n not in kind of a grand formation, but really revolve around a conversation that can occur and meaningful goals. And you go ahead and create a six-month pilot. But instead of going ahead and thinking of broader ideas, but actually go ahead and, and bring people that can play and commit to something. And then you open up the door and you walk out and you see what you can, mm. you can do. Mm. That's cool. Mm. Mm, one of those odd things. Um, <laughs> okay, maybe afterward. Um, so I guess. Hmm. Okay. I think it would be great if all arts administrators, EDs, program officers, uh, arts and cultural funders, um, and program directors. Maybe boards. I don't know. Um, take some get really serious about expanding their political education. So that might be doing in an undoing racism training with the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. But getting started in really thinking critically again about social, political, economic context, and really historically locating how our work came to be what it is. Um, I think it's about developing shared language. I think it's about wrestling with similar questions 
I think it's about expanding our sense of where we are and how we do our work mm -hmm. and why we've gotten to where we are. Um, so I think that would open up some of this space for this sort of values-based leadership of the future that we've been discussing in the future that is now. Um, so there are a lot of resources out there actually to do this kind of work. It would be about prioritizing the financial and or time commitments mm -hmm. to make it possible. And I think it's also about getting really honest about how difficult it would be. It will be, it is, to wrestle with these kinds of questions and being committed to that process. Um, so it's not a small thing, but I do think there are resources and things people can be doing right now to do that. I'm really encouraged that Grantmakers in the Arts has been doing that yeah. with a cohort of program officers in mm. particular, mostly program officers um, from across the country at different grant making institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and so to somebody's point about what funding needs to do and changes that funders need to make, mm -hmm. Laura, mm -hmm. um, I think that I'm encouraged that there are some of these conversations and now that GIA has made this a priority mm -hmm. for the organization as an area, like a core, core work of the field around cultural equity and really thinking and practicing that. So I'm encouraged by that. Um, I think that, again, I think it might start literally with every arts organization having a value commitment to attend some sort of community meeting that's not about art every month. Somebody's got to do it. Maybe everybody has to do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe just because you're a good community member on your own individually, but coming as an institution saying like, we are engaged with questions about housing or with mm -hmm. questions about zoning or with questions about whatever it might be. But like actually starting to practice mm -hmm. existing as community members, even if you're not coming and saying, Laura, to your point, like, oh, we have so much to offer. Oh, let's do this partnership right now. Mm -hmm. It's really about showing up, being committed, learning and coming back, mm -hmm. right? And starting to build those relationships that can transform practice in the future. And then I think I'm just gonna put it out there and it's probably not gonna happen <laughs> tomorrow, but I think if all funders meet cultural equity within their domains of core goal and value, that would be really great. I don't know when or how that would happen, but I think the GIA work is um, encouraging in that it's gonna seed some field-wide conversations that can precipitate that level mm -hmm. of practice. And all I'd say, Sanji, I think your idea of embeddedness is really great, but I think, again, the idea the analysis of power is that it's not really the program officers who are doing the decision making in most places, right? It's the boards. And so I think really being really clear about where the spaces are for people to move and shift practice and how and why things happen within the funding arena mm -hmm. is actually really important and could be further illuminated um, for folks who are working on the ground like, why can't you do it? You have such great values and you're in the field and then you went into the foundation world and you know, a lot of program officers really struggle with that because the structures are challenging. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, so at least the first two are doable in the near term, the third one, I don't know, we'll see. It's good to have aspirations. I like aspirations, okay. So Barry, I think to, to answer your question directly, I would say stop make, trying to make the case and actually be the case. Um, and with that, I'm going to read an inspirational quote. <laughs> what? I'm gonna, uh, which is from James Baldwin. Uh, I think the artist is a disturber of the peace. He is produced by the people because the people need him. His responsibility is to bear witness to and for the people who produced him. You have to bear in mind that everybody wants an artist on the wall or on the library shelf, but nobody wants him in the house. <laughs> and I say that because the next thing I'm gonna say is the artists need to go and participate in local government and they need to be present. So everything Rhonda said, I agree with. They need to see where the money is and where the resources are and where the people are and what is happening in their city. And that is the artists and that is the arts organizations, that is everyone. Um, we need to start adopting less, less exclusive language that draws barriers between all of the different players um, in, in the arts and between the arts and others. Um, switch from a scarcity to an abundance mindset. Um, hey, we should stop applying for grants if we're so upset about them. Just stop applying for the funding from those funders and then tell them why you are upset about them. All of these people that we are upset with, we can start that change dynamic. Um, I would encourage people to start participating in multi-year budgeting processes. Mm -hmm. So if we want to create the time, start planning to make the time within our budget, like budget for those time and resources. Um, and to create better benefits for our employees. 
because while we may not be able to give them money, we can give them time. And the fact that entry level employees are given two weeks paid vacation for three to five years, some places, their first years, is I think abominable. Um, I think everybody's playing it safe and it's really easy to snuggle down in like the status quo and in dominant culture. But if we start really checking what our priorities are, and I think we do need to examine the privileges that we hold and the responsibility that comes with that, that's gonna start us like using that writing arm. That is the writing arm that's gonna start us writing the models, even if the model is our own and each of us individually. Um, so I think, I think this is gonna be a little bit redundant with what Sanjeet said, but I, I feel like at the heart of so much of what we talked about is the, just the power of talking and listening openly. Mm -hmm. And um, I was reading this book recently about called Solving Tough Problems. And he, this guy, he goes into countries where there's lots of conflict and he basically just gets people together to, to talk and listen openly. And I think openly is the important word there because you can talk and you can listen. But you can do both of those things actually in a very closed <laughs> um, sort of mask of mirrors kind of way. And um, he uses the metaphor of the, the fist in the hand. So it's like the fist is talking and it's loose. So it's not that you're you know, putting your fist down to say something, but it's, there's still space there to take in something new. And the hand is, is listening, it's, it's receiving, but it's mm -hmm. firm. Um, and I think talking and listening open, openly is something that we can do on so many different levels. So one-on-one. -on -one, talking about getting together with a coworker or an employee and creating a space to talk and listen openly about what's really happening, doing that within an organization. I mean, a leader tomorrow could decide to sit down and talk and listen openly with their staff. Mm -hmm. Between organizations and funders, we've been talking a lot about that as a field as a whole and I think across sector. And that takes safe space and it takes permission, it takes a shared mm -hmm. sense of purpose, it takes facilitation, it takes time and space and I think, you know, Sometimes that's going to come from funders, and I, I just wish there were more funders that supported time and space to listen and talk openly. Mm -hmm. And I think in some cases, at least within organization, it comes sometimes from doing less of what we're doing that's not really useful anymore. I think sometimes we hold on to things just because mm -hmm. we've been doing them for so long. And I think a way to be self-actualized and to be self-determined is to carve space out in our organizations by, by doing less by actually letting go of things. I think that's incredibly mm -hmm. hard and, and creates fear and is obviously tied into you get funding to do certain things, but taking a hard look at what maybe you can actually let go to make space for new things. Mm -hmm. And then I think the other thing I've kind of been obsessed with lately is this idea called working open that comes out of the um, software world. Um, the open source community like Mozilla where people work together on source code to improve something and to hack it and to remix it and the core values of working open are transparency and participation and democratization and I think as an art sector we we need to be working open we need to be doing a better job of figuring out what our source code is and sharing it with each other and hacking it together and I think our source code is our process it's not our product and I think we need to be sharing our learning and our failures and our works in progress mm -hmm. and not only what is the kind of final kind of product. Um, and just lastly, like, I'm kind of a facilitator by trade, but I just really believe in good process. I believe so much in mm -hmm. it. I think I probably believe in it too much, <laughs> but in my heart of hearts, I believe that good process design of bringing people together to, to think and talk openly, to share, um, I just really think that's what it's all about. I don't know how we do that, but that's the now and the future that I would like to see. Talking last is really like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no I'm going to sum it all up. And then I gotta, uh, first, I need to say that uh, I have to thank a lot of the funding, the funders who helped me come up with these ideas and really help test and mentor. So just to name a few and not inclusive, but Olga Garay, Sam uh, Miller, uh, San San Wong, Roberta Uno, Hong Vu, Judy mm -hmm. Lee Reed, um, Emily Todd, and Pamela Clapp helped me shape, understand, and know, under, understand what leadership is. And so also leadership can occur in different places and not acknowledge that it's not executive director, but it can happen from community, mm -hmm. it can happen from the artist, and so that uh, 
in terms of me, it's it, it, uh, kind of the transparency. For me, it's about the stewarding audiences and actually how are we working with our, or, our, our uh, audiences and our publics and our communities hand in hand with transparency, recognizing what are the resources that we are bringing to them, what are the resources that they are bringing to us, how are they actually reframing these ideas, this information, so that they are actually telling us what the value is instead of us telling them that this is why it should be important. Um, and so that it, having the organizations be flexible enough to recognize that those, that stewardship means it might have to shift some things mm -hmm. and that you have to be responsive in that aspect. Um, kind of going back to the, the Netflix thing, to me, this is about the, the, the whole local war, farm to table movement. Uh, people understood that and like it took a while, but now they, so many restaurants are thinking about like how are we looking at, but it became a movement and became something that people understood that local has value, mm -hmm. has uh, some specificity, something that we really need to take advantage of. And I think that that is what I hope that we are all so thinking about that. And like mm -hmm. there, there is a movement that happened nationally, but also it started very much about individuals who are leading on a very uh, specific level that wasn't about just food. It was about sustainability. It was about these larger issues that they were able to then put their food into. So how are we also thinking about the larger issues where we can acknowledge that we are part of and uh, can bring something much to it? So. And I would just say, um, I, I love your final point because uh, having brought up the next Netflix thing, I, I think that a lot of the, my hunch is, is that a lot of this localized uh, movement, local food, all that is really a kind of maybe subconscious response human response to the fact that so much of our world is virtual and it's like we want something we can touch and we know where it comes from yeah. um, which I think is really powerful and I think the arts are perfect kind of fit for that um, so thank you all yes. thank you Barry thank you all for, for being here for the guests and I think it's very difficult very frustrating in two three hours to try to get everything out that you've been thinking about for so long that I think a lot of ideas were put on the table tonight. I think the people who will watch this over the next few days, few weeks, few months, there'll be something for everybody there to, that will spark some thinking. So I'm very appreciative. Thanks again to West Staff and, and to Carmen and to the uh, crew and everybody who helped make this one uh, a real good project. Um, so we'll do some follow-up. And um, I think this was very good. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, it's a wrap.